the start of the show. Right, okay, I think we're nearly there. We're gone. Hello. Hello. There he is. Yeah, we're good to go with that. Okay. Active super. Um, I'll just give you a quick look. Uh, Make sure everyone's okay. joined us. Very good. Technology is working. <laughs> oh, there's Dawn. <laughs> well, I used to start. Yeah, yeah. Blending against the. It's fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'll bring my microphone. Good afternoon, everyone. Just before the meeting commences, um, I would just like to welcome everyone um, to the authority meeting in public and just draw your attention to some safety messages. Emergency exits at the back of the door if you need to leave the room. And again, here at the front of the hall. Um, you know, as usual, this meeting is live streamed, so just be aware of that. You will be part of the record. Um, and please, everyone, switch off your phones and actually switch off. Don't just put them on silent because it can interfere with the, the wireless signal. Um, this is an interaction between the authority and the guard, the commissioner, and, and his team. So there will be no opportunity for people to question. So I just uh, like to remind you if you need to leave the room, just really do it quietly just so it doesn't interrupt the meeting. And I think that's it. Josephine. Uh, Helen, thank you, Helen. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this meeting, the Policing Authority with the Garda Commissioner and his team. Um, for those of you who are seated in the audience, you won't be aware, but perhaps you can see on the monitor, that we have Commissioner O'Cool on live streamed. He's out of the country at the moment, but he's joining us uh, by video link. We're also being joined by video link by our colleague, uh, Maureen Linus, who wasn't able to travel to be with us uh, today. So um, managing the, uh, our guests here and two video, uh, two, two video links and my own colleagues is going to be my challenge um, um, for this afternoon. You're welcome, Commissioner. I hope you can hear us. Thank you very much, Chair. I can indeed, loud and clear. Very good. And Maureen, can you hear us? Okay. I'm glad I checked. So we, somebody might have a piece of word, have a word with Maureen about her arrangements uh, while we're proceeding with the meeting. This afternoon's meeting is longer than usual uh, because we had, we planned for several months now <coughs> that this meeting would be de devoted to issues to do with children and policing across the spectrum, ranging from children as victims to children as suspects and to how the Gardaí perform their other statutory functions in relation to children. However, because of our um, agenda in February, not being able to complete it, we have added an additional hour today in order to deal with the matters relating to public order incidents in Ancoson. So because the meeting is longer than usual, I just want to, in terms of um, housekeeping, I want to make it clear to my colleagues and commissioners, to your team, that if people need a break, feel free, I think, to do it spontaneously. We won't take a formal sus, but if people need to, uh, need to leave the room, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and to do, it, to do it spontaneously, and I'll leave it, leave it to yourselves. Um, so with those uh, introductory remarks, um, I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, Moling Ryan, to begin with our first agenda item this afternoon, which arises from the Garda, recent Garda inspector report in relation to child sexual abuse. Um, and I suppose I should say by way of preamble, it's a report that caused the authority serious concern. The, um, the um, I won't say lack of progress, but not having complete progress from the last time this uh, matter was reviewed was problematic for us. And also issues to do with children continuing to be at risk. Um, and you'll, you, as you might expect, a lot of our questions we'll be focusing on, on those issues. So, uh, Moling, if I could invite you to begin. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Chair. And so, as the Chair has mentioned, um, what we're focusing in here is um, the in Guard Inspectorate Report on um, responding to child sexual abuse, a follow-up on their 2012 report. And what I propose, um, um, together with my, um, we have my colleague Valerie, who will also be um, 
putting some questions in this area is to give some context, and I think it's I think it's very useful to give some context in relation to how serious this particular this particular issue is. Um, firstly, uh, 2013 uh, World Health Organization report: child sexual abuse rates worldwide wide stand at 20% among girls, 5% to 10% 10, 10 among boys. Europe, the rates are 13.4% among girls, 5.7% among boys. And applying these figures to the population of children in Europe suggests 18 million children suffer from sexual abuse. The Irish survey that was undertaken in 2011 among a representative sample of over 3,000 participants aged 18 and above has estimated the rates of child sexual abuse in Ireland to be higher than the European average. <coughs> stands at 20% among girls, 16% among boys. So it's hugely significant in, in, terms, in terms of society here. And it's a significant issue, obviously, for the Guardian and for Tusla. And we recognise the, um, the inherent difficulties associated, associated with this. Um, but can I, can I also mention maybe just, just a couple of other things? According to your pulse records, 66% of all sexual offences committed uh, in, in, involved a child. Um, and only 14% of suspects described, described as strangers. So the numbers involved are, are very, very significant. So by way of introductory question, if I might, if I might put to you, Chair, or, or, or to your nominee, is how would you generally currently characterise the service delivered by the Garda Síochána in the area of policing, the area of child sexual abuse? Great. Well, morning, if I could start. Yeah. Maybe just to say um, that obviously this is a, a developing area. It's an area in which we've uh, put a lot of energy over the past few years. And um, with the assistance of the inspectors who point us to best practice uh, in, in the um, investigation and in the treatment of, of uh, victims of, of uh, child sexual assault, etc., um, you know, we have been making progress. Uh, and we have it at the centre of, uh, of the efforts we're making on lots of fronts uh, at the moment. So uh, child-centred policing, I think, has been mentioned, and that is where we want them to be in the context uh, that the child's voice needs to be heard. Uh, and we need to make every effort, both uh, in our own gift, in the context of investigative approach, but also in the interagency approach and in the joint up piece to ensure that we are serving uh, that group in particular, that vulnerable group, uh, in the best way that we can. Uh, so I know there's uh, some very uh, well uh, experienced members sitting across from me there who have taken, uh, in the context of our, of our National Protective Services Bureau, who have done lots of work in this space, and maybe they could uh, maybe flesh out some of the issues for you uh, in the context of the question you just asked. Thank you. So who'd like to take up the... Um I, I, I might just hand over maybe to, to Assistant Commissioner O'Driscoll and, and, and Detective Superintendent Daly, who are dealing with the implementation uh, of the recommendations and can provide a, a detailed up, uh, update. Uh, I think uh, in 2015, the importance of uh, improving the service that we deliver to vulnerable victims was a critical concern uh, of Angarda Síochána, and we restructured the operation within what was then known as the National Support Services and is now called Special Crime Operations. And a critical element and aspect of that is, is the area of children and ensure we provide the necessary supports uh, uh, that we possibly can, the best that is available to us. Uh, it is an ongoing process that we need to continue to improve uh, and there are for sure key areas that have been uh, outlined and identified for Angara Shia to, 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 to improve. But a key step, I think, in that direction was the establishment of the Protective Services Bureau. So maybe just to further enhance that, I'll hand it over now to, to, to John and to Declan, who can take us through some of the detail yeah. around that. And, and, and just, just to ensure <coughs> that, I, that I use my time to best effect, sure. if it could be as succinct as possible. Okay, well, first of all, I think it needs to be emphasised that every member of the Guard of Chicago needs to understand the vulnerability of children, no matter where you are positioned in the organisation. And I can say as a person who headed the Garda National Immigration Bureau for a number of years, that throughout my time there, I frequently refer to the fact that the most important issue we dealt with in the Immigration Bureau was vulnerable children arriving at our ports. And indeed, I brought that to the uh, table of Frontex when I sat on the management board of Frontex, the European Border Agency, and made it a priority 
during Ireland's presidency of the EU and hosted uh, other EU uh, countries here uh, uh, in order to prepare an appropriate uh, procedure for European border guards throughout Europe. But in more recent times, and through the modernization and renewal program, we have seen the establishment of the Garda Protective Services Bureau. And that bureau uh, has a focus on vulnerable victims, uh, whether they be adults or children, but it has a very particular emphasis on children. Within the bureau, very uh, particular units have been set up, including a, a national child protection unit, uh, which is a unit which now has an input uh, from the TUSLA uh, and a person assigned to it. Uh, many of the recommendations that are made in the inspectorate report uh, relate to a need for better coordination between agencies uh, and they are not one uh, recommendations that we alone in the Garda Síochána can implement. And, and we have a particular emphasis on uh, implementing recommendations coming out of, I think it's chapter two, which deals with the interagency cooperation. And, and Valer Valerie will return to that particular area. And uh, in relation to the issue of children, we, we now meet on a frequent basis with, the, uh, with TUSLA. I jointly chair uh, a, a strategic uh, committee uh, with a senior official in TUSLA uh, and we have responsibility, have been respon assigned responsibility for uh, ensuring that the recommendations uh, coming out of Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Shannon's report and the inspectorate report are, are implemented in an appropriate manner. It is the one issue in my career that I have sat at a table with the Taoiseach, Taunish, uh, minister, and another minister and the Minister for Children, along with Deputy Commissioner Toomey, dealing with the, with the relevant issues arising from reports. Uh, and I think that is a reflection on maybe the whole of government approach. And we see it in terms of, and very much look forward to the fact that a senior counsel, Ms. Briggs, has been appointed to ensure that there's a coordina coordination across all the government departments uh, in implementing the recommendations yeah. made in the inspector report. I recognize, I recognize this, and Commissioner, the, the, the work, the progress that has been made in terms of the interagency. If I, if I might maybe add a little, little bit more specific, one of the issues that the inspector noted was that some of the cases that examined investigate, had been investigated with, with pace and to a high standard, but they also reported many investigations drifted and that there were significant delays in taking victim statements, arresting, interviewing subjects, sending cases to DPP. And it, and it noted that your policy, the Garda, the Garda policy, said that investigations should be conducted within three months. But the feedback that they got from district superintendents um, informed that the cases um, that cases can take six to nine months to complete. They also found from case files the cases are routinely more than 12 months old, and in some cases, two years. What have you done to address the issue of timeliness of engaging or dealing with such cases? Okay, well, first of all, we have now established the backlog that exists in each division, uh, and in fact, that has revealed that there are particular divisions, uh, and I think maybe, in fact, three divisions might account for maybe 70% of the backlog. So we have uh, ensured that particular action will be taken in relation to, to having appropriate staff uh, <coughs> there to conduct interviews. So many of the delays are on occasions, the delays result from the fact that we cannot interview children for reasons that again are outside our control. So for example, we, we will require the consent of, of adults, usually parents, and that consent is not always forthcoming. I, I, and, and I acknowledge, I, I acknowledge, I yes. acknowledge the significant difficulties that you face. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned again. I'm still yeah. concerned in relation to timeliness, and I'm looking at the at the comparative figures, for example, in relation to the UK, and the number, the, the percentage of cases that in that jurisdiction fall out out, yes. out of that three months is, are considerably less than the percentage of cases that fall out, out outside the three month. Um, a figure for the Garda Síochána? Well, I think the, the most important input into ensuring that those issues are addressed mm -hmm. is the additional uh, resources that have been afforded to the Garda Síochána. And at the centre, through the creation of the Protective Services Bureau, mm -hmm. who in itself is now much uh, better resourced than the day it was formed, but also has a very important role in, in uh, ensuring that the divisions are implementing and, and investigating crimes in an appropriate manner and have the appropriate skills. The introduction of the local divisional protective services units is key in relation to that. Yeah. And you know, we have seen recently independent 
evidence provided by the courts uh, through FOI to uh, a number of journalists, which has shown that the, the level of delays in particular cases involving children uh, uh, has, has decreased considerably, uh, and that backlogs that we have had in the past, particularly during times of recession when we didn't have the resources that have recently been assigned to us, that those backlogs are being addressed in a that's, significant that's, that's manner. Enc that's, encouraging. that's encouraging to hear. Um, but, but you did mention, for example, that, that um, the, many, many of those um, the areas where delays occurred have uh, occurred with, in, in three particular divisions. What are you doing in relation to uh, areas that aren't meeting the objective that's in your particular, uh, in your policy? That's the first part of the question. And the second, if we were to ask you to set an objective, um, say, say between now and the end of the year, would you be in a position to come back here and say, look, the number, the percentage, the percentage have taken more than three months, which is part of your policy, has been reduced now down to small, minuscule. What are well, you, first what, of what, all, what would you propose doing? Uh, where uh, interviewing is an issue, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and a person of inspector rank has recently been appointed on a full-time basis uh, and where it was planned to put that person elsewhere, I ensured that, that the individual concerned and it's uh, inspector Karen Clifford would be positioned in my office uh, a number of doors away from me uh, okay. and there is daily interaction uh, now in terms of addressing all the issues in, uh, relating to interviewing of suspects and interviewing of vulnerable victims in some of the cases where uh, a delay has occurred, personnel have operated on a part-time basis. So one of the immediate uh, actions to be taken is to ensure that those personnel will operate on, on a full-time basis. And also, uh, there are divisions that have a zero uh, uh, return in terms of uh, when, when asked about any backlog yeah. in terms of interviewing. Uh, and so the additional resources maybe, or the resources available to those divisions uh, will be afforded to other divisions, the problematic divisions in terms of the backlog. As associated, associated with that, which came out very much in the inspector, was the, 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 issue, the issue of training. I'm sorry to come back to, mm. come back to training, which we do, which do regularly, but um, if, if, if you look in terms of the establishment of your sex offender risk assessment and man management model in 2007 that brought together the key agencies in terms of monitoring and manage, managing uh, convicted sex offenders subject to notification requirements. One of the issues that the inspectorate notes was that not all Garda members involved in various risk assessment processes were trained and the report stated that the gap needed to be addressed. Have you addressed that gap? And this is again, if we're talking about uh, training in relation to interviewing, uh, we, that has been addressed and additional courses are being run, but as well as that, in, in uh, the coordination meetings or the strategic meetings uh, that I chair jointly uh, with TUSLA, we have ensured that there is going to be a 50-50 input in terms of TUSLA staff and Garda staff uh, in relation to training uh, in, in respect of interviewing of children, uh, which will greatly enhance uh, and coordinate our actions in terms of dealing with vulnerable children it, that it, arise in, in is cases. It, is, it, is, it your, is it your objective, Assistant Commissioner, to ensure, to ensure that, for example, again, with part of the criticism that, 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 that um, uh, the, in relation to the risk assessment processes that all people involved, that all the guardian involved are going to be appropriately trained, and also, for example, where, they, where there was an identification that there was no training course for members of the child protection units, that most members hadn't received any special, specialist child sexual um, assault or child protection training. Do, we, do you anticipate that that will be addressed during the course of 2018? Indeed, and, and it has been addressed. Uh, uh, as I speak, there is a course running uh, over the next couple of weeks in terms of a level three training. Uh, and I think you know, the, the first report, the 2012 report, unfortunately coincided with that time when uh, uh, just <coughs> as we were about to enter into a phase of seven years without recruitment, uh, I went seven years without having one additional member of staff assigned to the National Bureau I was in charge of at that time. And I think in the short period of time uh, since uh, recruitment has started back into the national units, above anything else, we have tried to uh, ensure that people will see that we are properly utilising those resources and ensuring they are being afforded to the areas that most require them. And children is at the top of the list in that regard. Uh, and I think the creation of very specific units in the Protective Service Unit uh, Bureau that 
Declan is attached to here beside me, uh, and he is in charge of, I think that has had a major impact, uh, and the coordination between ourselves and TUSLA uh, in addition to that, uh, and ensuring that, that there is joint training where that is required, uh, and that both agencies work together in a coordinated manner I, in dealing with children. I, I do I think all I, of that will, I will do help acknowledge to that, improve that has the situation. Been, that has been, um, uh, progress in that area. I need to, to continue to focus on the inspectorate report itself, and I want, to, I want to spend a moment or two in terms of information and data quality. And the review highlights the fact that many of the poor recording practices identified in the 2012 inspection still exist, so that was the end of, end of last year. And, and one of the big concerns that I had going through was, for example, the timeliness of recording. Um, and I, I think that was in 2014, it said only 60% of sexual abuse crimes were recorded within 24 hours. 22% of pulse records created more than one month after the complaint was received. 13% of records created more than three months after the complaint was received. And that was, that was even a decline from the 2012 report. Um, they, they identified a non-compliance with crime counting rules, delays in notification to Tuzla, delays in the reclassification of incidents, delays in the submission of files to the DPP. Can you explain not just the problems in the timeliness of recording of incidents and pulse, but also the decline in timeliness since the 2012 report. There seems to me to be significant issues in relation to, in relation to not just, not just the, the timeliness of recording, but the actual recording itself. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of the pulse-related issues have been addressed in, in uh, very recent releases of pulse, what we refer to as a 7.3 release of pulse, which in summary is addressing a lot of the issues that have been raised in both the inspectorate report and indeed in Dr. Geoffrey Shannon's report. Uh, and I think, you know, when you look at Geoffrey Shannon's report where we gave him open access to all our records, he, he stated that he examined in excess of a half a million records on Pulse uh, and there, were, there was a problem in relation to 41 particular records. But if, if, I uh, might, if I might, though, if I might take issue with you here, um, it, it, it appears to me from the figures there in the inspectorate that it's not an issue with the system. This would suggest an issue with the people. Are, you know, if, if, it's, if it's an issue of sexual abuse crimes, you know, a significant percentage of them not recorded within, within what? Within, within, within months, three months, 13%, three months after the complaint was received. That doesn't seem to me to be a, a, an issue that, that, that can be managed by doing something in another, another aspect of the, of the pulse system itself. It doesn't seem to be a systemic issue. I think that one of the most important uh, ways of addressing that will be the Divisional Protective Services Units, uh, four of which have been created to date. And by the end of this year, there will be, uh, I think in our policing plan, we say an additional four, but we expect to uh, ex exceed that. And, and by the end of next year, we will have them in every division. But those units will be monitoring and ensuring uh, and indeed, the management teams in each districts and divisions have been notified by way of a, a HQ directive in recent times in terms of uh, uh, highlighting the issues we have, involved. We, we have had issue, though, with, with HQ directives before that haven't had an impact on the ground. And do you, do you understand the authorities' concern here? In 2012, when this report was issued, there were serious concerns with, time, with, 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 with the timeliness. Four years later, it had gotten worse. So I'm saying, what, what, what are you doing to address it? This, this yeah. was serious, I've seen it as a significant, a significant issue. Um, and, and quite clearly, steps weren't taken, or certainly adequate steps weren't taken. Are you, are you now saying that, that you're now taking further steps? How, well, will, how, will we know, how will we know, how can you reassure the authority that within the next three, four, five, six months, that there is going to be a significant issue, for example, that there is nothing, there's going to be nothing that's going to be three months, as long as three months, that is nothing that's going to be as long as month, one month before it's recorded. I mean, yeah. this, this is sort of reassurance that we, and noting the sensitivity of this, this particular Indeed. topic, I don't think that we, we can allow it to pass unless we get some assurance from you, indeed from the commissioner, that this is going to be addressed. Uh, maybe if I can just provide some clarity on, on it, Molly. Um, in an earlier release, uh, of Pulse, we ensured that the district officer had line of sight of all of these incidents that, come, that occur in his, in his area of responsibility. Prior to that, it was dealt with on an individual basis. From, from, from the release of Pulse uh, 6.8, from that period on, he had full line of sight of all incidents when they were recorded, but most, of, most importantly, he also had line of sight of when they occurred. 
So he has now specific, not only does he have the responsibility to do it, but he now has the management information to enable him to do that. And that then is overseen at the centre by the National Protective Service Unit. So there is a governance structure in around that, and the information is available on an ongoing basis. So we would expect that that, 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 that situation will rectify very, very quickly because the information is now available to everybody. See, see the concern, the concern, and I've just got a couple of minutes left, and the concern that we have is, is the issue of accountability, and the issue of accountability has raised its head time and time again, and I appreciate the, 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 um, what you say in relation, in, relation to, um, uh, in relation to what you're doing, but if you look at the report, the report found um, and that there was significant difficulty, and I'm, I'm using, using the same heading of accountability here, the board found there was significant difficulty in obtaining the information information in relation to referrals from a number of Garda divisions as to what the outcome was of the referrals sent to them. And, and it's explicit, it says, no information was received regarding 105 referrals in 12 divisions. And from my perspective, it's incomprehensible that a significant number of areas have failed to respond, despite reminders which are sent there, um, to a request for information. And this information has considerable importance. I was saying this is an extraordinary, extraordinary difficult area. What are you doing in relation to ensuring that, you know, if, if you look for information that has responded to speedily, if you send a reminder that people are taking it extraordinarily serious, seriously, if, if, if there's a second reminder gone, it would appear to me as moving towards a disciplinary issue. How are you dealing with that issue? And I'll, I'll, I'll include the Commissioner on this. To my mind, this is a significant issue of accountability right through the organisation. I, 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 I might ask maybe... Well, I start maybe just by, uh, from a strategic point of view in the context of what you've just uh, spoken of, Moeen. Um, I have visited every Chief Superintendent Bar 2 at this stage since the beginning of the year. And that has been uh, the, the uppermost and most important point I've made to each and every one of them in the context of uh, you know, the, the urgency that needs to be applied to uh, information that's required, etc. And spent a lot of time talking, and, and, and I'd be satisfied. I can, I, I am at this stage can reassure you that I, if, uh, of the two that I still got to meet, uh, but of all of the others, mm -hmm. I'm absolutely happy that they can see the importance of getting information that you just spoke of back I, and getting act, things actioned. I take, uh, I take the, right the point in relation to importance, way. importance, Commissioner. But it's the issue of the consequences of not responding is what is what is what concerns me. And I, I think you're quite right in terms of the action you've taken to try to emphasise that element of importance. But but if if you have situations where requests for significant or importance, which is significantly important, is uh, is not responded to, and then there's a and then there's a reminder, and that's not responded to, what what are the consequences? in your view, or what should the consequences be? Well, obviously, uh, the consequences of not responding and the, 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 the broader consequences are explained in the context of uh, that there may be victims that are left without um, proper attention, etc. Yes. But the consequences, consequences internally uh, are also pointed out. That it's not, it, it's not satisfactory to me as Commissioner that uh, information of that type wouldn't be treated with the utmost urgency in all, in all cases. And this is something that we need to keep stressing. We have a very good, uh, I suppose, framework in place where this message can be uh, cascaded down the front line in relation to capture and um, uh, how, how information is fed back up so that we can uh, see where the issues are and where that breaks down. And if it's because people aren't giving it proper attention or aren't seeing it as an important issue for themselves, well, then obviously there are uh, sanctions that can be imposed. Yeah, yes, and I don't want to labour this particular point, Chair, but I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that, that, that part of the accountability is the, it's a whole element of supervision which has come up time, time and time again, the extent to which it may be a sergeant or an inspector or a superintendent or whatever, and, and the, extent, the extent to which it's seen as, as important to them and how the extent to which they ensure that um, the request for information is, is taken seriously and, and is, is, uh, is appropriately communicated and sent on. Well, what are, again, well, I, just, well, sorry, Commissioner. I can let John maybe, uh, John, John Toomey or John O'Driscoll uh, maybe uh, deal with the, the, the detail of the question. You know, we, we had, as I say, the earlier report in 2012 uh, and then a report in 2017. During that time when we had serious issues with resources, we are now in a very different situation. We have put our resources in, into places where we can now ensure that issues relating to accountability and supervision 
uh, will be addressed. That information that wasn't available for whatever reason through pressures on divisions, districts, maybe, uh, that is now with us in the Protective Services Bureau. I've seen the results of it in recent days. I've discussed with Declan Daly, the Detective Superintendent in that area, uh, how we're going to address it in relation to each district and division. We're going deeper into it now that we have it to see uh, what the reasons are in specific cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're in a much better place. And I believe if a report was done year by year now into the future, you would see significant improvements uh, because we are uh, putting the resources where they are uh, going to achieve best results, in my view. Thank you, um, Moling. I'm going to pass over to Valerie in a moment, but before I do, I forgot my manners. I should have welcomed Detective Superintendent Daly and also Chief Superintendent Quinn as your first time with us uh, in public session, although obviously the authority has engaged with you before, and, and I should have done that at the outset, so apologies, and you're very welcome. Valerie. Thanks, Chair. You hear me okay on this? Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, I want to just continue on the same theme, the same area. Um, I would like, if I may, to address the areas, first of all, of the area of referrals from abroad and within Ireland, and indeed other ways of establishing suspected use or sharing of, or dissemination of child abuse material, particularly online material, which obviously is a growing problem, and the effectiveness of the Garda Síochána response in this area, okay? Then I want to um, come back to the, the area of investigations of allegations of child sexual abuse, including the maybe a little bit more on the protective services units, if you wouldn't mind, uh, maybe touch a little bit again on the training of Gardaí and also back to multi-agency working, okay? Um, just on the online material piece, um, Maybe, Commissioner, I could begin with yourself and just ask you, what would be your measures of success or metrics for success in this area if you had a, a dashboard on your desk and you were looking at, at um, data that would tell you about success in this area? What, what, what would you be looking at? Well, uh, I think in the, the first instance, it's just to get uh, an early assessment of what size the problem we're dealing with uh, and as we all are well aware, the whole area of cybercrime, not just in this area, is uh, becoming, uh, it, it is an international problem right around the world. Um, and what I would hope that we can do is uh, pick up on best learning and practice from our colleagues around the world uh, and then ensure that we give it uh, a proper structure and proper resourcing as well, of course, and proper training because not alone is it uh, a fairly uh, significant issue for all of us in the policing area, but it is one that grows exponentially, uh, and therefore it, it poses a particularly difficult issue for all law enforcement agencies around the world. And if I was to ask you but, about the, what would be the indicators of success in terms of Angarda Siakana's response, what would those indicators be for you? Well, obviously, to see that the, the, the avenues that are being used are being curtailed it would be one. Uh, it opens uh, up uh, opportunities for criminals who uh, are out to make money on, on uh, all kinds of, of uh, uh, various activities. Uh, and it's important that like, we're one step ahead. So, I mean, if we can put a dent in what is happening online, but again, they're very uh, easily able to get around uh, whatever goes into the, 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 I suppose, the back end of these systems and trying to curtail it. Uh, so it, it's a constant challenge for us. Uh, so I think it's an understanding first of the size of that challenge that we face and then how as a group or as a team of international law enforcement agencies that we can tackle it. Okay. Not just in this area of child sexual abuse, but also across many the other broader, areas. The broader cyber, cyber crime area, obviously. Today, I suppose, we just want to focus on this area. And maybe, maybe I come to your colleagues here. Maybe could you tell us very briefly how you deal, first of all, if you get referrals from abroad about suspected use, maybe through websites, sites, etc. here, what technologies do you have to, to inform you? Well, for, first of all, uh, I gave a commitment to a number of weeks back when we had a, a, an exercise, an operation, Operation Catch, that we would have four of those exercises in this current year, and I hold to that. Uh, uh, there were a significant uh, number of searches taking place, I think 31 on one day, uh, and that resulted from the use of the 
uh, equipment that we have. I have also met with the head of the cybercrime unit in Europol who has assured us that where more advanced equipment is required for specific operations in Ireland that we may not have, that he will make it available to us. But perhaps uh, Declan Daly, who is in charge of those units, will be able to best describe how the units operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, what might be helpful um, for people listening as well, and, and I don't want to breach any you know, operational um, matters or confidential operations, but just in general terms, could you describe what alerts you have technologically and then how you act on those alerts? Well, well I'd be reluctant to give much information yeah. about mm -hmm. our trade craft and how we didn't, because obviously that's, that's, that's not appropriate today. But um, the alerts that we have out and how we, how we effectively deal with online child abuse is that uh, the guard, the, the makeup of a guard Shikana is very, very important because it's one police force. We don't, it's not separate law enforcement agencies. And we don't have the same problems that other jurisdictions have with deconfliction in terms of, of, of different agencies looking at different targets. And again, and if you, if you delve deeper down into that, you know, the fact that we have a coordination role at the centre in our online child exploitation unit, mm -hmm. who then disseminate out, they, 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 they package up the intelligence and the, the information that comes in from, from other law enforcement agencies or from NECMIC, for, from different agencies, and that's the seminar out to local investigations. And I suppose at the moment, in the main, those investigations are conducted at local detective units, um, ex with the save with the divisional protective source that are in place. But when, when that, when all our divisional protective service units are in place, uh, online child exploitation will be exclusively dealt with by them. They're fully trained. The training for, for those officers is modular training. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one-year modular training course. Okay. I think maybe just, and I will come back to the protective services units because okay. it's obviously an excellent initiative and it's obviously going to take some time. So we yeah. might deal with just the reality at the moment. And by the way, I would like to say we do understand the, the decade of lack yeah. of investment, etc. Um, but we also understand that things are moving forward again now, that you have resources coming on stream. So it's, it's how things are operating now and from now on and how things are prioritised, I suppose, is, is of interest to all of us. So... Um, can I ask you, um, we, there have been a number of cases in media in, in recent times and a, a theme that is coming through um, is, is a delay in the, between the seizing. Okay, you've, got, you've mentioned the process in terms of intelligence packages, but the, day, the delays that can occur between seizing of computers and prosecutions. Can you explain why that is, please? Uh, well, the delay that's been uh, referred to, I think... And I don't refer to any one case, but... Yeah. That we, is it, it typical? It, is, this, is this a problem? I, I think what, what has been referred to uh, in recent times uh, is the fact that we had a delay, uh, which I think at one stage we were talking about uh, five and six years having uh, some uh, computers uh, un unexamined. We now have a situation where uh, we expect to have a backlog uh, eliminated by the end of next year. Uh, and I think... Uh, the courts in more recent times have spoken uh, positively about the improved situation uh, that we have in terms of the speed at which we can examine. But to highlight the challenge that we have, and I think beyond anything else, I think Operation Catch uh, tells us as a society we have a very serious issue in the amount of people who seek to uh, look at the type of material involved. But in one case, in Operation Catch, the, the amount of images is in excess of 100,000. Uh, and we have to examine those in detail. Uh, what we are, in terms of what we, was revealed in Operation Catch Phase 1, we, above any, anything else, want to ensure that there is no person who is a victim uh, who, whose image is in, uh, uh, has been discovered by us, uh, where we could intervene and prevent any further abuse. Fortunately, we haven't to date found any person resident in Ireland who we believe is the subject of any of the images that we have found. But clearly, we have an obligation at an international level uh, also to ensure if, uh, that we, uh, if we can identify a, a victim who is in other, another jurisdiction, that we uh, ensure there's a, an appropriate intervention on the part of law enforcement. Uh, many of the images that we have discovered where people, that people were accessing in this jurisdiction 
were accessed by other people in other jurisdictions, so we're talking about a number of police organisations uh, dealing with similar images or the same images in, in the course of their investigations. So there is a requirement for coordination there. But I think um, the, the fact that there are so many images being discovered in, in individual cases is a challenge. But the additional resources that has gone into the newly formed Garda National Cybercrime Bureau, uh, combined with the additional resources which has, have been put into newly formed units dedicated to child-related issues in the Garda National Protective Services Bureau, is ensuring that uh, the backlogs that exist uh, are being speedily uh, eliminated. Okay. We have some information here, which I believe the executive got from yourselves, that between 2010 and 2015, um, child protection examination requests made up about 40% of all requests for examinations made to the, the GCCV in those years, but they made up 75% of outstanding requests, which seems to suggest that they were being deprioritized in some way. Can you comment on that? Well, it's not necessarily the case. It could be that they're, they're more difficult to uh, access and the levels of encryption that okay. are encountered yeah. uh, are more elaborate. Uh, and again, in particular cases, we will seek outside uh, uh, expertise uh, if that can uh, assist. But I, I think the fact that we are endeavouring to undertake uh, four uh, specific uh, phases of Operation Catch and all that it will bring uh, that will flow from that, and there is no indication that there will be any less number of premises searched in any phase, any one phase. Mm -hmm. So there will be hundreds of additional cases taken on this year alone, and we're satisfied with the arrangements that Declan has uh, arranged through his colleague, Michael Govins, who's a detective superintendent in the uh, Garda National Cybercrime Bureau. We're uh, happy that the coordination is there between the two bureaus to ensure not alone will, will we take on the additional cases, but the additional material will be examined in a more speedier fashion, okay. uh, and that the relevant uh, resources will be available in terms of technology. Okay, <coughs> and I, I'm just looking here, at the, just going back to the inspector's report, because we appreciate you making progress here, okay, but we, we really also see the urgency and the great challenge you have, particularly as you say, this is probably an area that's going to grow and become more complex technologically as well. So the inspector has highlighted delays in, delays in forensic examinations, you've addressed that, so you're saying that by the end of next year you expect to have cleared the backlog. That, that's still a long life in the, the time in the life of a, a child victim who hasn't been identified. Well, that, that doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that a, a victim will be left vulnerable. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of other investigation, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of other aspects to an investigation okay. that will ensure that vulnerable people are not uh, exposed to additional uh, harm. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, again, I mentioned earlier how we, we have, see where government have appointed a senior counsel to ensure coordination across departments. Uh, and that process that government have introduced will involve a quarterly reporting in relation to uh, implementation of various recommendations. Uh, and I, I think that will uh, help to ensure that we will be able to report the progress that we claim we uh, uh, expect to okay. be able to report into the future. I, I'm sorry but to interrupt, sorry, just, just, just on the time. Yeah. In relation to those cases, all those cases where there's, where there's evidence of an immediate child, uh, you know, exploitation or abuse, all those cases are prioritised. So if is, the case is there a delay, in, though, between seizing of computers and examining, examination of material? Well, well is, there's, is there's, there's, there's there's a, there is a there? backlog that's well documented okay. as a backlog, but there's a lot of work that has gone on um, within that bureau to, to reduce that. And as, if my as, laptop was seized today, when would it be examined? Well, I, I don't know. It depends on if your if your laptop was taken today, and if there was a, if there was if there was a, an issue, a concerning issue of child protection, concern, that that would be examined. There's a triage process process that goes through first, and that would be prioritised. So, mm -hmm. you know, every day with the woman, or every time we are investigated, if we have that information that suggests that there's a risk, well then we answer okay, that. Okay, because that's important. Because the reason I ask is that the the inspector's report and and tell me if it's incorrect, yeah. but it identified the absence of triage as an issue. Which no. seemed to imply that no, the, I think the, laptops I think, were literally stacking up. Yeah. I think the, the inspector is talking about uh, triage on, on, on scene on a search site okay. rather than triage. Okay. End, so. okay, thank you. The other, um, another matter mentioned, and obviously we've discussed this in other contexts as well, 
But the inspectorate identified underuse of civilians in this area, and given the agenda and um, great sort of license you have, I suppose, at this stage to recruit civilians, is that an area that you can um, make progress in? Yeah, um, it, it is. Uh, I think what both uh, John and Declan are talking about is the making reference to to the, to the coordination between the local. Um, Protective Service Unit and the National Protective Service Bureau, and there's a similar uh, piece of work on going on in the com uh, Computer Crime Unit, in that we have two regional units have been established, one in Wexford and one in Cork, and the intention is that there will be a similar unit in every region uh, as soon as we possibly can, and in each and all of those, the intention is that civilian experts will 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 be will, okay. will be engaged. We have had some discussions on that, and we are um, we expect in the next. Uh, very very short while that we would have one composite plan for the whole national the national picture so it'll be a single a single okay a single application just a, a last question on this one in the policing plan in this area uh, you've got some targets in terms of increasing of numbers um, in terms of detections identification of victims nationally and internationally is that something that you seek to measure or is that a valid question okay um, obviously uh, you know identification of Victims online is very, very important to us, mm. and I suppose, I suppose, significantly in the last six months, we've established a victim identification unit. That 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 was, we removed staff from administration positions and we replaced them with with, with uh, um, unsworn members, and uh, and we established a victims unit. That victims unit has substantially increased our identification of victims uh, since since it was established in September. Um, you know, in addition to that, we work very, very closely with Interpol in relation to their uh, extra database, their their database of, of victims from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. So we are we have we are trained to trainers in relation to that. So we're very, very highly placed in terms of work around uh, the identification of victims uh, internationally, and that's very, very important. So that continues to be an area of growth area for us, an area that we are putting a lot of energy into. Because obviously it's exceptionally important. They're the, they're the areas that we want. And in terms, of, I suppose, as well as of one of the one of the issues that we have in this country is that you know our young people post explicit images online, mm -hmm. and how we deal with that is a very important uh, way. And we we have a, a strategy that we deal with it in a in a, um, a consolidated way with Tusla. So when we have an incident where a child has placed some images online, uh, we don't attend to the house. Um, in isolation with ourselves, just on Gary Shikana, we go in a coordinated approach. So obviously, we're dealing with whatever issues that we have to do with there uh, ourselves from our, our perspective, and obviously, Tusla are there from a welfare, child welfare perspective, and that is a okay. that is a, an area which has been very, very successful. Thanks, thanks. Um, just moving on a little bit, um, and Rowling's already touched on some of the areas, so I won't replicate that. You've mentioned the protective services units, and we have. Four pilots up, more to come. When do you think all those protective services units are going to be in place and operating to best practice? Um, our policing plan says, sets out a target of, of an, an additional four. But when is it going to be finished? Well, we, we expect that at the latest it will be finished will be the end of 2019. Okay. We, when, when we looked um, at, f at an additional four, yeah. we sent out an application and a request for divisions that wished to be considered yeah. and those that they felt could meet the criteria required. Okay. And there's quite a ro robust criteria set, set, set out by the National Okay, Union. can I sort so, of move I'll, on there and just ask you? So the, re the reality is that that's how long it's going to take and I accept well, that's how long it takes. If I could just takes. maybe finish, because yeah. I think there's an important point to be made in all of this. When we set out a target of four, we got 15 applications. So I think that is an indication of, of, the, of the level of a, a priority afforded to it by uh, each of the divisional officers and how they want to get the proper structure and resourcing and training in place. So, uh, as I say, we, 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 we are satisfied that it will be the okay. end of 2019 at the latest. Can I ask you then, at the moment, in the areas that are not yet PSUs locally, albeit great interest and, I'm sure, local development, um, first of all, can you describe what's the typical profile of the typical investigator of a, of a child's sexual abuse, and I'm talking about allegations of abuse here locally, just for clarification. In terms of the seniority of the guard who might be dealing with the case, the experience, their training and their education, because the impression one gets is that it might be a little bit patchy around the country at the moment. How do you ensure consistency and sensitive treatment of victims? Uh, I might ask that maybe to go through the detail of that. Okay. But yeah. there is an assessment done of each and every crime, and there is a decision made 
as, mm -hmm. as to the appropriate investigator and the appropriate priority that needs to be afforded to that. But maybe Declan can take us through a little okay. bit more about the profile. Okay, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to give a definitive answer on the, the profile, but obviously what we want is we want experienced personnel investigating uh, you know, this serious time, some of the most serious crime on our, on our statute books. And, I, I, you know, I, I see and I recognise that the inspector made reference in the report to, you know, uh, junior and inexperienced members yeah. of Veskin. Now, yeah. what we've done in relation to that, we've commissioned our analyst service to look at the service profile of um, members who are investigating sexual crime. Now, that, that, that is, is, is in train at the moment, and we're waiting for that. And that will deliver for us uh, the information that suggests, well, you know, what, are, what is actually the numbers behind that and, and the, the level of service that guards are investigating such a number. So that will give us a guide and then we can, we can take the appropriate action in relation to that. But I suppose looking forward, all those serious cases will be investigated by the Division of Protective Services who will have staff. Yeah, but at the moment, they're not at in the place. Moment, so at the moment. Like so, we yeah. fully appreciate they will be in place. But, and we fully appreciate a lot of work has to go into the future. But at the moment, yeah, but, what but, are the risks out there? Well, I, I, I'm not mm. suggesting there's risk, but even in the even in the divisions that there isn't a protective service unit established, a lot of those divisions have child protection units in place, or they have, uh, you know, they have established, you know, units akin to the division of protection while they're waiting for division of protective service because the interest in setting up those units is very, as the commissioner said, is very, very, very uh, substantial. Okay. For and the more serious cases, we will appoint a yeah. senior investigating officer. Oh, we'll so take it on. It'll, it'll depend on... How do you identify the more serious cases? Is that through the, the, the Well, there will be an assessment made at, at, a, at a local level. Okay. And, and in terms of the, the level of... Uh, I'm not asking about the nature of the case. I'm just the process. The involved. process, yeah. So if it's a serious uh, sexual crime involving rape, uh, well, then you, you may have a, an SIO, SIO appointed uh, by the district officer. Uh, if it's, it's simply a case of uh, a person uh, exposing themselves in public, well, obviously, that's a different category of offence. So uh, the more serious uh, um, and trained... It's the process, really. So who decides on the level of seriousness? Well, it, it's a matter for the district officer okay. to... Uh, and is there consistency? Are you happy there's consistency in well, how the, that where operates? There, where there may not be consistency may not be the fault of the district officer. It may yeah. be <laughs> the age uh, structure of his uh, district personnel. Yeah. So, uh, un unfortunately, uh, where nobody of a senior rank is available or, or with more extensive services available, uh, you may find somebody with less service investigating. But for again, for the more serious cases, uh, and on a regular basis, uh, Declan's unit and the Protective Services Bureau is providing additional assistance. Okay, so and there's indeed, obviously a degree of judgment there, and, and they, can, they can call yourselves. Can I just ask, I know Moling asked there about training, um, and we're all aware of the, the large numbers of recruits into the organisation, which is a very positive thing. Uh, we're also aware that the, the age and experience of your new recruits isn't similar to the past. You've lots of very, you've, you've, you've older recruits, let's say, than we had, than you had many years ago, with experience in different areas. Uh, the inspectors, actually in the, 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 the other inspectors report in the future policing in Ireland, there was reference to specialism um, in terms of career paths within the organisation. Have you looked at this area as an area where there may be people, maybe um, already skill sets and experiences within your uh, recruitment group that could be specialised in this area or may opt, may want to opt to specialise. Is that something you'd look at? Well, certainly, you know, where there are competitions for personnel coming into, for example, serious crime operations, <clears throat> the experience that a person has and the qualifications will be taken on board. And there are people who have a wide range of uh, of experience, particularly say in relation to cybercrime. I was looking for in assigning people to the side, cybercrime bureau people who mm. would have a background in that area and a number of individuals in the organization, including at their own expense, uh, have acquired qualifications. I what I'm saying is what we've, what we've, I think what we've experienced is something new in terms of the history of the Gardaí that your, your, your recruitment cadre at the moment or in the last three, four years has included people in their late 20s who've had other careers, perhaps in social care settings, et cetera, who may have both an interest and an experience in this area. Is that something, and maybe it's something we'll see in the HR strategy that we're waiting for, is that something as an organization 
You've thought uh, of I, I think yes. I, I think you've touched on the, the HR strategy. I, I think, think what that would do. Wants to pick that up. John, and, uh, and that's kind of your last question. Okay, okay. Commissioner, I wanted to come <laughs> in there. The multi-agency working to Noel. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Valerie, I think uh, you're right in saying that we have, we have a, a, a very experienced group of people coming in uh, through our recruitment phase at the moment, highly qualified academically and lots of life experience in different areas. I think what we owe to them, first and foremost, having applied and joined the Gath Shikhan, is that we give them a good, solid, broad-based training in the context of policing. And of course, once they get through probation periods and that they have, uh, you know, the experience of what it is to be a guard in whatever district they work, that we can then, of course, start to look at their skill sets that they brought into the organisation and how we can best leverage that uh, in the context of uh, all the challenges we face. So I know it's slightly off topic, but that specialism piece is something we look forward to in yeah. the HR strategy. But just as one example, yeah. there are a number of people who were teachers in a yeah. past life who we brought in to protect yes, the services yes. bureau. Yes, so it's happening are, informally. Yeah, and they're very uh, able to offer something in particular in terms of training uh, for other people in the organisation in, in this area. Okay, but the chair has cut me off. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie. I think the, the themes will continue because... We'll be moving on to another aspect of children in a moment, but just before I pass it on, I there are some kind of worrying governance questions arising from that exchange. I'm going to save them for the end because uh, my colleagues may pick them up. I want to ask you two quick concrete questions, which I suspect are probably, the Commissioner probably doesn't have the data with him. Our former authority member, Dr. Conway, raised with you um, probably a year or so ago about the stage three training. And at the time, you had almost nobody trained to stage three level. Now, I noticed in your exchange there, uh, John, you talked about a training course which is ongoing. How many stage three trained interviewers do you have now? I don't have the specific number. No, uh, but is it a multiple of three, or is it? Four. I know there are a number of, uh, the, the course I think it's actually next Monday that it is starting because I know the person who has been appointed uh, on a, per a permanent basis, on a full-time basis uh, as the training coordinator, that she herself is, is attending that course and she has informed me that that course is starting shortly. Uh, and uh, <coughs> through her involvement, we're examining uh, the time frame that we require to uh, complete training across the organisation in terms of making sure that we have an adequate number of uh, stage three and other training at the various levels. Like so we really need, would like to know that there is progress in this because how you engage with children as victims and indeed suspects and other vulnerable adults mm -hmm. is critically dependent on having a complement of stage three trained interviewers and you know we've been asking about this now certainly since 2016 so I, I leave it with you to come back to us, but being addressed, which it kind of suggests it's kind of somewhere. So I'm, I'm really keen to see a concrete number. And the other question I want to ask you, and maybe this was simply um, a turn of phrase, so I'm giving you a chance. You said in the case of rape, there may be an SIO. We have in the past received, received assurances that in cases of rape, there is always an SIO. So could you help us please? I think that, that there is there's, uh, categories of crime which it is uh, mandatory that an SAO is appointed. I think that's, and, and of which rape is one of those. So there is a, a number of crimes, and then there's a, a certain, beyond that, there is a discretion for the district officer where he must, <coughs> where he can, if the seriousness of, of the case so requires it, he will appoint somebody else. But there are, I think, I think there are, um, there is a HQ instruction which sets out in these cases, this they will be appointed, and in other ones, at your discretion. And is rape one of those? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it on now. Is it Judith and all? Judith first. Judith Gillespie. Thanks, Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner and colleagues. Uh, I'm going to continue um, our, on the broader issue of the relationship between uh, the Guardi and uh, younger people. And Commissioner, you will know personally that there's much international research around the relationship between police and younger people, typically younger people demonstrating lower confidence in police than, than other age groups. And we're looking forward to the forthcoming results of the Public Attitudes Survey in which you've specifically included the cohort of 16 to 18 year olds, which we very much welcome. 
But there are perceptions of over-policing in the public space uh, with regard to children and under-policing when they are victims. So I'd like to hear your own assessment uh, on how would you characterise the relationship between Angarda Shirkona and children and young people? Well, uh, I suppose uh, children and young people, uh, you take them at their teenage years, once they start to socialise, that's probably when they first meet uh, in any, I suppose, real sense, uh, the uniform services as they go out on public order patrols, etc. And unfortunately, uh, because of the use of some um, alcohol, or else might might put into the equation, uh, they probably are meeting on Garda Shikhana in confrontational situations, uh, maybe for the first time that they ever meet uh, a law enforcement uh, uh, officer. Uh, and in that sense, uh, that may skew their view of the service uh, in that uh, Obviously, we are there to maintain peace and public order, uh, and uh, young people who are out to have a good time and enjoy themselves, and that's not something we want to, to uh, better in any way. Uh, but if they are encroaching or going across certain lines, then that, that has to be addressed. So, look, I, I think it's important uh, that we, uh, in, in our training regime, and our young people, and we do have a certain, I suppose, uh, you know, reputation. <coughs> in the context of being able to uh, engage with uh, the public across this country. Uh, and that, that should be the same with our, with our uh, young people. Well, uh, Commissioner, sorry, if I could interrupt you there. You, you mentioned training, yeah. uh, which is obviously uh, of huge interest to the authority. <laughs> and given the commitment specifically within the Code of Ethics with regard to respect and equality, and children are mentioned specifically in that commitment, could you just tell me what sort of training is provided to um, uniform Gardaí in relation to uh, engaging with children and young people? Well, but specifically, I can't give you detail, uh, Judith, but what I can say is that in the context of uh, law enforcement generally, uh, and of which obviously young people would fall, everyone falls into that category in relation to people who, who uh, would need to be addressed by a guard in the context of, of something that, that is, is happening in a public space, etc. Uh, that, of course, the approach would have to involve respect uh, and would have to involve uh, full, uh, uh, all our people being fully aware of all the pillars of the Code of Ethics. And it's in that context, generally speaking, uh, that I would say it's, it's a practice, it's a way of life, it's a way of doing your work. Uh, but I think we have to focus then on certain age groupings of people who, because of the timing uh, and, and, and maybe l lack of common sense or lack of experience or lack of, uh, uh, you know, um, maturity, that we have to be even more aware of that space, that our interaction with them may leave uh, a lasting impression which mightn't be positive, so we have to work even harder. Now, oh. I can't give the company actual detail of how that is actually put across in the, in the training environment, but it's something that, we're, that I'm well aware of is, is in the company, you know, that there's something that we are focused on. Okay, I, I just wanted to pick up then on the opportunity that the Youth Diversion Programme provides for a positive engagement with often vulnerable young people who may in fact be victims of crime themselves. Uh, and just to ask you the question, uh, given that it's a huge opportunity and there have been issues raised with various reviews ongoing at the moment, but just parking the detail of those reviews for the moment, how would you see the Youth Diversion Programme developing over the months, years to come as that positive opportunity? Yeah. I'd like to see your, your personal vision of that. Absolutely. Well, I, I think, you know, um, again, applying this, this is a formal structure, uh, which, you know, and I think this is where we can, we can really make the inroads in the context of uh, making it maybe a negative uh, first uh, encounter positive in the long term. In the long term. It, we have great potential in that, in that space, in the context of the management of our juvenile offenders, ensuring they stay out of the criminal justice system. And, sh and showing them and making them aware of the, the negative impact that anything of that nature would have on their, their future prospects, appointments, etc. So I think there's a great opportunity there. It's one that we uh, should be fully aware of. I think it's working well as we speak. There, there's lots of uh, very uh, positive feedback from the, in the context of how our juvenile diversion program works. Yeah, and uh, yet, of not, course, not there's lots of learning to be. Notwithstanding all Sorry. of that positive 
feedback, which you yep. quite rightly highlight and, and is often referred to by stakeholders. Uh, but notwithstanding all of that, if you look back at the Garda Inspectorate report on crime investigation in 2014, uh, it is clear that most, if not all, of the issues that have been unearthed in your various internal reviews, the Professional Standards Unit report and your ongoing review, all of those issues um, were specifically identified with recommendations for action four years ago by the Inspectorate. So I'd just like to hear your view on how you would characterise the organisation's response to the Inspectorate's recommendations four years ago, and would you acknowledge that if your, um, if your response to that had been swifter and more effective and more focused, that you wouldn't be where you are now with regard to the issues around the Youth Diversion Programme? Well, it's a very uh, complex and challenging area, Judith, uh, and in a space where there was lots of other things happening, uh, this was one, of course, and we, we take what the inspector tells us very seriously, all of their serious reports, uh, and it's not always in our gift as an organisation to resolve that, but we should, and, and, and we are, in the context of where we can put resources in, where we can change our systems and processes to deliver on what the inspectors have recommended based on their uh, search and based on telling us what best practice is. Of course, what we need to do is ensure that where the, and the, the, the issues that we have uncovered in relation to the operation of the, of the Youth Diversion Program uh, is one we uncovered ourselves by going in and it's important to ensure that we get to the bottom of where the, the what evidence can we uh, bring to bear to show what exactly does that mean for us? Where is the learning? What can we but, do to ensure? But that Commissioner, we're not if I may, if I may interrupt you, um, and apologies for interrupting you, but we are really pushed for time. There were three issues specifically that were identified. It was the referral of uh, cases that weren't suitable for the scheme, for prosecution. The, the follow-up of, of that, um, the the referral to uh, JLOs, the timely referral of JLOs. And then the third issue was um, the, the referrals that were stuck in the system as draft. Now, all three of those issues, as I understand it, were already identified by the inspectorate report four years ago. So my question again is, do you acknowledge that had you responded to that report with more focus and more effectiveness that you wouldn't be where you are now? Because all those three, those three things are within the gift of Angarda Shirkana. They're, they're not dependent on other agencies. So would you acknowledge that? Well, I, I acknowledge for sure where, you know, as I say, but we're, we're in a very busy environment. It, it, that, that's not the only thing we had to tackle at that given time. But of course, where we could give it, if we could throw all our resources at it at that given time, I'm, I'm sure that things would be different. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are systemic uh, kind of operation, not operational, but uh, technical issues in the context of how these things, uh, bind of correspondence, uh, uh, visibility of these files, Lots of those things have been fixed. We have been able to get in there and fix those. I know that uh, AC Lee is there, who, and he can address some of those that some of those things that have happened to ensure that the type of issues that you would rightly say were addressed uh, in 2014 and continued after that. That at this juncture, uh, I've been given assurance that those matters have been, you know, addressed in a way that those particular issues cannot be repeated. Uh, however, given the volume and 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 and. Uh, you know, the, 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 the variety of, of, of challenges in that space, uh, it's, it's, it'll be an ongoing challenge. Well, perhaps, thank you, Commissioner, perhaps I could turn to AC Leahy then with regard to the detail <coughs> of the review, if I may, and, and ask for your assurance um, with regard to the high-risk cases. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the issues that have been unearthed, again, are concerning data quality, appropriate counting and recording, but also some of those cases involve quite high-risk offences and high-risk offenders. And my focus is not just on the quality of the data, important as that is, but it's also on how you're dealing with those high-risk young offenders. So could you give the authority some assurance that you're prioritising the high-risk cases as you work through the volume, 15,000-odd um, cases that are being referred back to divisions? Okay. Just to uh, clarify, the actual volume is 22,000, just over 22,000. That's what we're dealing with at the moment. That uh, amounts to just <coughs> 7,000 children that are connected with those uh, issues. 
There's a serious investigation going on at the moment, as you're, you're, you're aware of. I have a full team uh, looking at this and the serious offences and the people that are most at risk we're front and centre and that, and they're looking at it from a victim's perspective, but they're also looking at it from a process perspective in terms of what went wrong, how it went wrong, what are the implications of it, uh, what caused it, the why answer uh, to all of this. And to go back to some of the, the, the previous questions uh, that you asked, uh, I think you could probably describe it as, as, as part of a, a system of programmes that was absent central purpose or theme. That's how I would describe it in terms of the uh, focus on children. I think earlier on somebody mentioned um, child-centred policing, which gives the, um, I suppose, the sense of a coordinated approach or a kind of a paradigm shift in terms of how you think about policing uh, children. And I think that's what's out there internationally at the moment. I think that's where the, the concept of child-centred policing comes from. I think there are four or five key areas that people focus on if you are going to coordinate your activities uh, around this, and the diversion program would have to be the centre of, of the, the wheel on that. And if you ask what should it be, it should be the jewel in the crown, far and guard Shikana, and could very easily be the jewel in the crown, but unfortunately, uh, over many years, it has suffered from a lack of resources and a lack of funding. Uh, and it was just, I, I suppose, I take my hat off to them for getting as far as they got with it and getting the results that they have. This particular examination that's ongoing at the moment certainly will be more uh, in-depth than any that has been done before. I should have an interim report, a brief interim report by the 30th. That's what I asked for. That's what I expect to get, and I, and I will uh, have that by the 30th. By the 30th at, of? Uh, of this month. Okay. And I would expect that there'll probably be maybe a four-week period following on from that that will require some analysis and assessment of, 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 of uh, what's in, what has come back, and then pro probably about six weeks after that to get to a final conclusion on the actual uh, examination itself. So that's the time frame we're looking at uh, at the moment. So will uh, there be a public um, face of that report? You talked about an interim report on the 30th of April. I, w when would you be able to make your findings I think public? we'll be able to share that certainly through the Commissioner's Office, through the Commissioner's Office. Uh, I don't see any problem with sharing it with the policing authority. I would expect that we, we will share it with the policing authority. But there are victims involved in all of these cases as well. So yes. we need to think about communicate. You need to think about communication with And, and, and we have done, victims. and that is going to be a feature of, of this. We are going to have to visit uh, victims. I'm uh, confident that is going to have to happen. Uh, we're also going to uh, have to follow up on individual cases of children uh, involved to see uh, where they are now and uh, find out what their lives have been like uh, since they've been through uh, the system. So there's quite a piece of work to be done around this. It won't simply be a report and that's the end of it. As you said, there are victims and there are children and that mix in itself uh, is not going to lead to a happy ending in this particular examination. It's not going to be pretty, the outcome, but wherever it takes us, it takes us. So j just to close off this part of the um, questioning, because obviously we'll get into more detail around yep. this probably in committee, and it is important we do get right into the detail in committee and, and, and not here. Um, but in terms of the outcome of the review, uh, there are individual officers here who have not done their job one way or another, and who have not been adequately supervised. So. What outcomes are you expecting at the end of this review in terms of performance and indeed potential discipline? Well, this was a matter that was discussed at the senior leadership meeting very recently, and uh, there's no free passes on this one, that's uh, for sure. And uh, chief superintendents, uh, as they're going through this, because this is happening at, out in each of the 28 divisions at the moment, and where they uh, see that an investigation under disciplinary uh, regulations is required, they're going to have to conduct that and they're going to have to bring it to a final conclusion. Thank you. Well, I'll move on from that now to just talk more broadly about the um, Juvenile Liaison Office and uh, the excellent work done by that. I had the privilege of visiting one of the projects in Dublin and it was really impressive in terms of the working with uh, youth workers there and the outcomes for younger people. But clearly with so many projects ongoing throughout um, the, uh, the organisation, 105 projects as I understand it, how do you ensure consistency of delivery, consistency of supervision, consistency of performance, and indeed the ethical issues around the difference in um, relationships with younger people, the difference in relationships with other interagency workers, and whether children in care are getting the same opportunities for diversion and discretion 
uh, as children not in care? There, sorry, that's a very complicated question, but it's around consistency and supervision and ethics. Okay, uh, I, I'll hand over to the Chief Superintendent who uh, has uh, a lot more of the detail in relation to this, but you're right, it's very, very difficult to get consistency across the country, across the 20 uh, divisions, and with over 100 projects uh, with various different JLOs and various different agencies providing the uh, engagement around this, consistency is an issue. At the moment, uh, uh, OIJS are looking at it in terms of uh, bringing the various different divisional um, programs together or projects together into a divisional structure. Now, we haven't uh, agreed to this in, in total. Yes, I think there are some significant challenges uh, there and we need to come in probably on the side of uh, uh, children and communities in relation to that to find a suitable outcome in relation to that. But it will uh, focus um, on getting some sort of consistency across the approach to them and in terms of who actually uh, is chosen to go into the uh, projects. So look, it is a challenge uh, because it is so diverse. We are focusing uh, on it, but I think we will we'll get a better focus over the next uh, year or two years because there are changes coming and there is a review of the 2001 Act taking place also. So that will take us into a new space. Yeah. But look, if you don't mind, I'll hand over to Chief Superintendent Quinn, who's uh, personally involved in this for many years as the director. Thanks, um, Judith. I suppose your question about, you know, how how's consistency, um, I suppose, you know, um, detailed and, and how do, as I, I, as a director over many years, how did I uh, consistently decide and what processes did I use? So just to say at the outset, uh, as the Assistant Commissioner says, we were a very small unit uh, and I would argue punching away above our weight uh, in terms of the dealing with the, the, the volume of, of uh, referrals that came through us. But we had a, a mechanism where, you know, when it comes to deciding on, on the, the sort of the profile of the young person, uh, certainly children in care, I, I suppose I could say it was broken down to probably three uh, distinct areas. Those children with family support, uh, which, you know, were probably once off, um, uh, sort of right of passage offending, I suppose, rather than more, more serious offending. Then er children that were in, in areas where they're, they're high crime areas. So, I suppose by their by their uh, social by their um, where they lived, they had um, perhaps issues like poor family support, and they themselves were exposed to a, a criminal environment. And then the third category were children in the care of the state. So, by and large, uh, the the, the uh, children that were in the care of the state were a category that were given particular attention by me in that uh, the state was their parent or, or in per, or parent, or locus parentis. So the diversion program, uh, most of the offences that those children were referred to me for were things like assault on staff mm -hmm. or a damage, criminal damage to property in, in their care homes. So those children were specifically um, maybe categorised for additional uh, support uh, or additional consideration perhaps in that uh, we have under the legislation the opportunity to have a, what we call a section 29 conference. So in those cases we try to bring the, um, it, it's, a, it's a JLO led conference, you can bring the other agencies together and work out a care plan for those children. So they, they were given a, a, a additional uh, focus from my perspective. Um, just currently uh, we are trying to engage with the um, young people, in, in particular in their care homes, um, that are maybe contracted out through TUSLA and that type of thing, so that we can actually get a sense mm. how can we work better with those <coughs> care workers, because invariably um, when things um, do um, present, the care workers tend to ring the guards and the guards uh, turn up and the relationship may well not be as, as, as good as it could well be. So it's a try and maybe create a meeting of minds in, in relation to how do we actually deal with that cohort of young people. But just maybe to take it back a little bit, you asked the question about how do we ensure consistency. And I suppose um, just recently I've got some extra staff in, in the, on a temporary basis in the, in the uh, unit, which has allowed me um, be put much more of a focus on the whole policy, uh, governance and SOP area. So I've divided up the team to a directing team and then a, a policy team. And that has allowed me 
um, you know, you know, work on the development side, which was we were struggling for a long time to move that forward. We were it was a stop start because a day job was a priority, and the okay. and, and the, the you know the timelines that we had to meet from a criminal perspective to get cases through the system because we those cases that were. Um, deemed suitable for the inclusion in the, in the diversion programme went one stream and those that were unsuitable went another stream. But <coughs> I'm, going, I'm going to have to stop yeah. you there because uh, time sure. doesn't allow us to go into this sure. in further debt. But it is reassuring to hear that there are special considerations and, and appropriate considerations sure. given to children in care. I just want to finish with one final question, if I may, Chair, and it's uh, simply this. It's very clear from lots of international research, not just on the island of Ireland, that uh, investing in younger people and diversionary programmes at a young age can mean a significant saving further down the pipeline in the criminal justice system. Is there any thought being given to uh, evidence-based uh, data collection around the uh, investment in um, JL and youth diversion programmes and the savings that that accrues to the criminal justice system later on? And, and making a case, in fact, mm -hmm. for more of this type of programme yeah. rather than less. I think that's the piece of work that uh, needs to be focused on right now because, you know, I can anecdotally say, you know, we're doing good things and we're preventing, uh, you know, people's further uh, in either investment in the state at a later stage or by other services, but it hasn't been given the level of scrutiny it needs. So certainly highlighting it here, I would, I would hope would bring that a bit, for, a bit uh, further, and I think your, your, your visit to one of the projects might highlight it, the, the evidence um, mm. for the, that's out there that actually can support families and young people. And what I also want to say is the, the, the benefit of the interagency um, effort has certainly in our Garda Youth Diversion projects um, has, it, had, has really um, showed that, that, that the investment is well worth worth. Uh, I think that's making. something perhaps we can follow up as an authority with asking more questions around that evidence basis yeah. to, to... If I might, Judith, just before we finish off on, on that one, we've started to re uh, reconstruct the actual department and the community engagement at the moment. We've broken it up into two bureaus. And what that has done is released the... What we didn't have before was a, a chief superintendent in charge of the diversion programme. We do now... We have also uh, included in that department to take over, we said, a community policing site in Sayre and Jack, which is also uh, child-oriented. We have um, a principal officer. Now, the principal officer's background is in the Children's Act Advisory Board. She's a qualified teacher. And also, it brings a very, a very different mix to it, while Superintendent Archie Superintendent Quinn uh, is a qualified barrister. Uh, she has control of the diversion programme, although the director uh, comes in beneath her. In the, we are now in a position to think strategically and act strategically uh, around this. So we're beginning to resource it, we're beginning to restructure it, so that we may be in a position further down the line to look at uh, child-centred policing, or certainly yeah. exploring the concept of it and bringing a bit of coordination to it. But we also want to see the current scheme working properly, yeah. effectively, with good data and good records. So that's a good start. Thank you. That's happening. No one, please. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner, and your colleagues. Uh, thank you very much. I particularly want to focus on Section 12 of the Child Care Act 1991, and for members of the public and those viewing, this is the section of the Child Care Act that gives a legal power to any member of Angarda Shirkona to remove a child to a safe place when that child is uh, in immediate risk of harm. Um, Dr. Geoffrey Shannon, who's the government's special rapporteur on child protection, undertook a, a, a review of how on Garda Shirkona um, uh, have been using Section 12 of the Child Care Act, and you very helpfully have provided us with a, a written update uh, on that. So, Commissioner, for you first, I want to specifically ask you as Commissioner, what particular govern governance arrangements have you put in place uh, to oversee the implementation of uh, Dr. Shannon's recommendations? Well, um, I know that one of the people sitting across from you there, um, Declan Byrne, uh, is, is centrally involved in ensuring coordination with John O'Driscoll of uh, Dr. Shannon's recommendations. Uh, and uh, the Section 12s that you mentioned, uh, and I know you've got an update on that, uh, this piece or section, the act that is uh, critical to getting children to safety, and uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me, I'm getting lots of noise on the line. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you very well. well. Yeah. We can hear you fine. Yeah. yeah, it's just I'm getting lots of echo or something anyway. Uh, that's fine. Uh, no, it's just um, there's a 
there's huge work and, and a huge priority going in. Uh, and I know that, um, again, from my own experience uh, around the country, in the context of getting children into safety, that it has been an absolute priority for everywhere I ever went in the context of ensuring that once the guard becomes aware uh, that a child may be in danger, uh, that uh, our first priority is to remove from that danger. Uh, and I know that, that you know, a section as well is there for that purpose, uh, and that uh, Dr. Kavishan uh, did make some commentary around the manner in which in guards are going to use that. Uh, so I think uh, Declan might be able to expand for you on the context of the broader set of recommendations and how uh, we are approaching those at the moment. Thank you, Commissioner. And again, I understand the difficulty with the line. I guess before I maybe look at some of the colleagues across the table, I think we do need to understand that Section 12 is a, a very a significant power uh, for any member of Angada Shiakona to exercise. It's a huge responsibility on those individual members to actually remove a child from their parent or the person in whose, whose care they're in. So that's a huge burden uh, and responsibility on individual Gardaí. It also is a power which has a huge implication uh, for parents, families and indeed those young people. So clearly we welcome Dr. Shannon's uh, report and your update on it. He, six of the recommendations in Dr. Shannon's report uh, have, are described by yourselves and the Gaudi Shikona as agreed with modifications. And very simply, I just want you, want you to be able to confirm um, that Dr. Shannon is aware of the modifications and that he has confirmed and is satisfied that the modifications you've proposed will still deliver on the intended results in his original recommendation. Okay, maybe if I can just uh, attempt to go back to ever so slightly, uh, not, not in the context of the question. Um, both the, the, the Assistant Commissioner and I attended a meeting with the, with, with the then Taoiseach in terms of the coordination of the implementation of the recommendations. We're aware, as we are with the Inspector report, that not all of these recommendations sit solely within the remit of Angarda Shirkana, but in an, effort, in an effort to ensure a coordinated approach to it. Uh, that, 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 was, that group and meeting was set up to ensure the coordination. In relation to Section 12, uh, I think it's important that, that Geoffrey Shannon's comments were, were, were positive in the main in terms of how, how that was implemented, albeit some of the recommendations he, 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 he identified indicated where there could be improvements uh, made in that. In the context of the accepted with modification, I know that Dr. Shannon has been involved and continues to be involved in the, in the discussion around what those modifications are. And Declan, who meets him, uh, and John, I might ask them to give us a detail of what that modification, but he is aware of them. He is in discussion in relation to each and every one of what those modifications Thanks mean. very much, Deputy Commissioner. I suppose it's, it's a very blunt question, Declan or John, whichever one's taking it. I just need you to confirm to me that he has accepted your modifications and he's satisfied with them. Well, he's been met on a monthly basis and there is a one yearly review next month. We believe that he is satisfied with the modifications that we have made and he will be in a position to confirm that next month, I think, when there is a, a yearly review completed, the first year after the uh, completion or, or the publication of his report. So, so uh, your understanding is that he is accepting your modifications well, as in they line have, with They have been discussed. Sorry, I, I, I've, I, I've had, had many... Uh, long discussion, a fruitful discussions with Geoffrey in relation to this matter. And what we have agreed with him, and what we've, we've said to him, is that obviously his recommendations are very welcome, right? Uh, it was a lot of work and he, and he put a lot of effort into it, and we're very, very happy in, in relation to, to, to the recommendations. Some of the recommendations, it was my job is to make sure to take those recommendations and to make sure that they work in a, you know, in the operational element. Because otherwise, they're just words on the page. So, in doing that, we're looking, and there are slight modifications. Geoffrey Shannon has been told all along, and, and, and certainly we've kept him informed, that the genesis of the recommendation we want to keep. There are some recommendations which are very challenging, but we absolutely want to keep the genesis of them. And so, the discussion with Geoffrey in around how to achieve what is the core basis behind the recommendation, maybe in a slightly different way. So we're not suggesting by any means that we're making radical changes. There are small amendments and a year in meeting with Geoffrey, which is an enhanced meeting on the 18th, we'll go through all the recommendations to him in full and then he will have the final say whether he's satisfied and so he's been involved in the process. That's, all that's a really help, helpful clarification and you might come back to us formally yeah. in writing after Correct. that meeting just to confirm. Uh, I think Deputy Commissioner Toomey quite rightly alluded to the fact that uh, 
you know, the, the safeguarding and protection of children, particularly in crisis, is not solely the job of Angadish Yokona, and you are dependent on many, many other players. And that's a good segue for me to talk to you a little bit about interagency working. Um, Dr. Shannon's report found continually found a poor and limited levels of interagency cooperation and coordination between Angadish Yokona, the Child and Family Agency, TUSLA, and indeed other agencies who have a role in this broader, in this broader child protection infrastructure in this country. Uh, and this has been ongoing since the commencement of Section 12 of the 1991 Act. So I absolutely ex understand that this is not solely the domain of Angadish Shikona. And when everybody else closes up and goes off duty, the men and women of your, your service uh, seem to pick up for everybody. So I understand that backdrop. However, what I'd like you to talk to me a little bit around is the, uh, the uh, TUSLA Angadish Shikona liaison protocol that you refer to in your update. Uh, that you gave, uh, you produced in December 2017. And what I'd specifically like you, as briefly as you can, given the time, could you tell me what, what changes to the previous practices have been introduced in the new protocol? How have they been communicated to every single member of Angadi Shikon who holds this power at the front line? And are you now satisfied with the level and quality of interagency cooperation? So I guess three questions uh, in that space. Okay. Well, first of all, I suppose uh, a National Child uh, Safeguarding Strategic Committee has been established, which I jointly chair with uh, Fred McBride in Tusla. Uh, and we monitored the implementation of the recommendations uh, in, made by Dr. Jeffrey Shannon at that committee. Uh, there have also been a number of other specific developments in terms of, of interagency cooperation. And Declan will give the detail about that because there is now a member of staff from Tusla actually assigned to the Child Protection Unit which exists within in the Bureau which he is attached to. It'd be great, Declan, if you could take me down into the protocol and the actual practice okay. changes yeah, and okay. the communication with individual members throughout the country. Okay. Um, well, the first thing, the protocol arises out of Children First. If you remember, uh, you know, Children First in, 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 in late 2017, it was an introduction of the new act and a new set of guidelines. Prior to that, Angarish uh, Shikaran were involved with TUSLA in the drafting of the protocol. So the old Children First, 2011 Children First guidance, had the, the practices and policies and procedures in place written into Children First, whereas we've removed that, put it into a protocol so that it's more fluid, so that rather than having to wait for the whole Children First to be changed, we can now change it very, very quickly between two signatures, between between two members of, in the organisation. So what's different the, in so terms the difference of frontline is, practice? The difference is we've, we've, we, we, we looked at it and we, we dissected it and we now have uh, filled the gaps because within the old, the old section there was gaps, there was gaps at different levels. So you had obviously an interaction at very, at, at sort of the, the end level, the last step level where you have a guard and a social worker, then you have the Children First Interagency Committee, the Management Committee, you know, which is an inspector and a team leader. There was a gap then where you'd had no interaction between a principal social worker and a superintendent of Gardaí Shikán. That's been filled in now, so we've we've written that into the policy. Also above that, then you have my office, who meets then with the Children First Forum, who meets with uh, with my counterpart in in Tusla, and so and then above that, then you have a commissioner commissioners a com uh, committee, then the National Child Safeguarding Committee. So we've filled in the gaps there. We've we've written into the policy as well all the, the issues in relation to mandated reporting. And it's much more user friendly. We've some of the joint action sheets that are referred to in the old Children First were really probably not fit for purpose. We've amended them. We have a new form which accompanied it. That new form is now, we've now put it on Pulse. So it's a completely Pulse based form. Hopefully by 2019, because we're working on that at the moment, is that Tusla's uh, IT system and the guard's IT system will talk to us and there will be a seamless transfer of notification. So the guard will complete the notifications. It will be, it will be uh, examined by a sergeant and it will, will travel then. Uh, in relation to, I suppose, um, that, that would be the main, they're, they're the main differences there. It's much more fluid and, and user friendly. Just in relation to the whole issue of co-location that Dr. Jeffrey Shannon mentions, there have been a number of meetings that along with Declan, I've attended with uh, Minister Zappone, and indeed Declan has travelled abroad, uh, and I've travelled to Northern Ireland with, with the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs in order to examine uh, how uh, such situations are handled in other jurisdictions and with, with a view to the Minister being informed as to 
uh, what is most like to, uh, likely to operate here, uh, where that sort of joint <coughs> cooperation and, and is given, into the thank, future. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. And given you know, that you have this oversight and you have this protocol in place, um, what, what regional or local difficulties have you identified with other agencies' cooperation with you that need to be addressed? Well, at I, a local or a regional basis? I think, I think one, of the, one of the big, just before I answer that question, one of the big significant developments in relation to that is that, that with the Strategic Liaison Committee is that we have, in relation to the recommendations from the Geoffrey Shannon report and in relation to Chapter 2 of the Inspector report, that there is a joint implementation team. So it's not just the guards looking at this ourselves. So we have, we've, we've assembled a team from Tusla and we've amalgamated that one together, Chicago, with our own team. And <coughs> the, the cohort of of recommendations within both reports that are common to both agencies and speak to both agencies have been, <coughs> have been looked at and examined together. So that, that gives us, I think, real strength. Okay, and we're looking at our information sharing and, and I think one of the issues was our barriers to information sharing and that has been, I suppose, our priority at the moment to make sure to identify those barriers and we're, we're working at the moment on uh, an information sharing protocol uh, that will climb over those barriers. And on the 7th, between the 7th and the 9th, we have a workshop in a lonely house in Navan that's exclusively designed to work on that uh, protocol and to bring, bring that to an end product. Now, obviously, there's difficulties with that in certain times. Data protection regulations coming down the stream have to be taken on board. So there is challenges there in relation to that. But the goal, the ultimate goal is, at the end of the day, that there will be a seamless transfer of information between Tusla and Agarda Shikana and vice versa. That's our ultimate goal okay. in relation and to that. Maybe just to come at, come at, thanks for that, and to come at yeah. it maybe from the perspective of the frontline member of Angadi Shikana How? on duty okay. tonight, <coughs> or tonight or any other time, and their first line supervisor, their sergeant. Can Angadi Shikana, can you assure me that Angadi Shikana can now access appropriate specialist professional childcare services from Tusla and where appropriate the HSE outside of office hours in every single Garda district? There is an outside or out of office service there provided and in fact uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey had asked as part of his recommendations for the creation of a, of a pocket card which we created so that, that, is, that is a template of it, it's, it's very much complete, we will show this, it's, Jeffrey has a copy of it and if he is happy and satisfied with it, that will go on the back of that card uh, has all the numbers, every member of a Garda Shikana will get a copy of that. So, so for that's example, you know, if, if a toddler is taken away from its parent tonight, yeah. is there anywhere in the country that toddler will end up in a Garda station? Well, okay, but, well I've had many discussions in relation to Geoffrey, in relation to whether a Garda, a Garda station is the appropriate place. When at 2 o'clock in the morning, if a child, you know, the powers of Section 12 are exercised, obviously, Tusla have to have some time to mobilise. That's just the practicalities of it, okay? And in that time, in that period of time, you know, where do we take the child? We can't obviously leave the child in the back of a troll car, that's not appropriate. And a safe place for that child is a guard station. It may not be the most appropriate place, but with the circumstances that are available to us, a hospital, if, if there's an acute need, obviously there, but at least in a guard station, the child is warm, the child can get some refreshments, the child may be able to get some sleep. And we've gone through that issue with, 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 with Geoffrey. I accept it's not ideal, it would be, Ideal if we had that, and, and with the co-location that possibly will come down the line in relation to the Division of Protective Service units, we may get to a stage where when we are exercising at Section 12, that Tushla will be along with us. I think we're a little bit off that yet, but that's certainly there. That, that's the groundwork that we're making up on. Well, I'm not in any way being critical. Oh, I understand that. I understand yeah. exactly how difficult this task is. What I'm trying to understand is, um, you know, within a reasonable mobilisation period for Tusla, you know, do you get the service or, you know, are there places in the country where you, do, you realistically do not get a 24-7 prompt uh, professional childcare response to assist your members with a very difficult task? And I need you to be quite frank with me on well, that. I, 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 I mean, there's, a, there's an escalation. I mean, there are, diff there are difficulties ar ar arise, and particularly on dealing with one, one case, I won't go into the case uh, specifically, but where difficulties where you have repeated Section 12, <coughs> right? And it is difficult. It is difficult for... Apologies for the line. Sorry. There's a phone ringing, I think. Um, <coughs> so, sorry, Declan. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. There, there are difficulties, but there's an escalation policy. So where, where issues arrive, arise in relation to out of hours, there's an escalation for, from both sides. So where there's an issue in Garda Shikana, 
you know, my counterpart, Mr. Boyd Dodds, can escalate it to me and I can deal with it from, from, from the centre. Or in the reverse, if I have an issue where there's a lack of service uh, or perceived lack of service, then the escalation is to me and I can deal with it there. So, you know, it's difficult because um, in some cases, uh, you know, <coughs> you, you could have three or four a night, but there is a facility there within 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 Brunel, the central building, where there's an air of office service, and if a social worker is required, there's a non-call social worker available. Okay. Well, look, that, I, I don't, I I, maybe we'll take some of this offline to committee, but yeah. maybe just to give me some yeah. reassurance then, in terms of the, the numbers of cases being escalated, can you give me some view? How many a month? Oh, I mean, maybe one a month, two a month, it depends. Okay. So it's, it's, not, it's, not it's not a, a huge it's problem. Not a huge yeah. problem. It's not okay. a huge problem. You know. and would, I be, would it be fair to say that there are some, maybe some regional variations? Is it easier in the city, for example, than a rural area? Yeah, there is. And I think in relation to inconsistencies, one of the reasons why we established the National Child Protection Unit was to, to, to give us a consistent approach from Tusla and, and, and why there's uh, you know, a co-location with, with Tusla, to give us a level of consistency, to look at those area, areas where we have inconsistent, identify the best practice and make sure that that is consistent. But that is the whole theme of what the National Child Protection Unit is. It's not the Garda Child Protection Unit, it's called the National Child Protection Unit because it's, it's important that it has that Tusla involvement as well. Okay, thanks Declan. And I just want to move on then to the, the, the card, the laminated card that you held up. That was one of the recommendations and, and well done for getting it to the point and hopefully he, he does sign it off with you. Um, one of the issues uh, he talked about, uh, Dr Shannon recommended to, that Angada Siakona should develop a protocol regarding the exercise by your members uh, of Section 12 powers and, and particularly in instances where it's a frontline member of Angada Siakona without recourse uh, to a sergeant or an inspector. I was puzzled or just taken aback a little bit in your quarter two 2017 updated, you noted that a sergeant may not always be available uh, okay. you know, to advise the frontline member. Could you talk to me about the kind of circumstances when that, where that might occur, where the frontline member has no recourse to a sergeant in any way? Well, it's not that the person wouldn't have any recourse, but they may, may not be immediately available, such as where a patrol car goes to somewhere which is removed from a guard station and there is an immediate situation that has to be dealt with. <coughs> it needs to be stressed that the legislator has given the power to a member of the Guard of Shikona and not to a, a rank above the Guard, uh, the rank of Guard. Uh, and there clearly will be situations where an immediate action has to be taken. But that's not to say that as soon as possible thereafter, there won't be uh, an involvement on the part of a supervisor. Uh, I think it's important to note uh, in Dr. Shannon's report that he did say, I found that in all cases I looked at, there was an appropriately restrained use of Section 12 powers, uh, and he felt it was important to emphasize that. And he said the overwhelming, overwhelming finding was that Gardaí commit great effort and to treating sensitively and compassionately when they exercise the Section 12 powers. Uh, so what we need to look at is to ensure that um, we agree with Dr. Shannon, that we uh, include uh, an input from somebody at a higher rank, uh, most often at sergeant rank, as soon as possible after the uh, Section 12 has been implemented. But at no time should a member feel that where there is somebody at risk, where a child is at risk, that they should be in any way delayed in implementing the power. They obviously stand subject to scrutiny in terms of the decision that they made, and clearly we have opened up uh, uh, our um, Section 12 uh, cases to Dr. Shannon, and this is the conclusion he has reached in terms of how we've used it to date. I'm being uh, told I'm uh, pushing the clock here. So, look, thanks. Just, just maybe, maybe on that on that area, then, um, Dr. Shannon had particular recommendations around reassuring uh, the public um, about, the, you know, the, the risk of appropriate and proportionate use. Or sorry, appropriate and proportionate use of Section 12 removing removing a child. Uh, I understand that Angada Shikona have done some analysis of the appropriateness or inappropriateness of each of those interventions, and you're considering whether or not you will share that with other, other organisations. I'm interested to know uh, have, what data have you got on inappropriate use? Uh, or, you know, have you looked across, across um, well, the service to see? That, that was the purpose of Dr. Shan's report, that he would tell us uh, uh, how we had used it. And his finding was that in, in each case, and, and indeed he had a specific requirement <laughs> to look at it to see if there was an element of racism in terms of how we implement it, and he found that that was not the case in, in any of the cases that he examined. 
so uh, he, he has examined all of the uh, Section 12 cases. Uh, he examined f around 500,000 pulse entries. There was an issue uh, regarding 41 of those, I think, uh, and it, what was found is that they rested within pulse, but uh, because they were associated with some other aspect of the pulse system, uh, that they weren't immediately uh, produced to him. Uh, but in each one of those cases, the Section 12, the use of Section 12 was examined and was found to be appropriate. Okay, and just, just, just a supplementary there, just, I mean, the recommendation <coughs> is that Angada Shiakana should publish statistics on an annual basis, and th that this reporting should also include details of the challenges and difficulties experienced by Angada Shiakana in the exercise of the power. My understanding is that Angada Shiakana are considering what agencies they will <coughs> share that information with. Therefore, the question was, what type of things are you finding? Or are you in a position to share it even at committee level with, with, with the policing authority? I think, I think from the Emily Logan report, the previous one, there was a, there was a recommendation in that report that we would publish on the, uh, the number of Section 12s. We do that, that we've, from that report. And one of, the, one of the areas of modification required is in around, is in around publication of those, of those uh, the information that you just described. Because obviously there's, 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 there's difficulties in relation to that where we decide not to invoke a Section 12. Um, well, the, you know, that's a, there's a risk assessment in around that. So that's one of the areas that we have set to discuss with Geoffrey on the, on the 18th. Well, look, th thank you very much. And again, uh, for the, the members of Ngada Shikona at the front line making these decisions, we absolutely appreciate the importance and the complexity. Uh, and uh, we will may talk more in committee <coughs> about the oversight. So thank you very much. Back to the Chair. Uh, Chair, I wonder if it's possible just if I could provide one, well, just one very quick item of clarification. Questions. We're not finished yet. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> just, to, just on the point that the question that Noel uh, asked there about the supervisors, I think John is making a difference between the availability of supervisors and the availability of a supervisor at the point in time that the decision is made. So I just wouldn't like any ambiguity around there are supervisors available to which a member can, can, can relate to. And I, th I think that was clear and the example of the patrol car, yeah. I think, clarified that very well <clears> for us. Sorry, Declan, just a quick question. You said that the data is published. Where is it published? No, I'm not saying it's published, but the, the, the issue in relation to, to Geoffrey's recommendation about publishing uh, yeah. certain information, that's a matter for, will be for discussion with Geoffrey. It's not published yet, because we don't, we don't... So is that one of the recommendations? That's one of the recommendations. You've accepted with modification? Correct. To which we will be returning? Correct. Okay, thank you. Now I think that helps to clarify it. Uh, I just wasn't sure. Sorry, Noel. Uh, Commissioner, I have one or two questions for you, if you don't mind, before we move on to the next agenda item. The problem of interagency working and the importance of it for the best outcomes for the child has been highlighted in a number of the reports we've been discussing and indeed in other reports. Just in that regard, to make sure that it's optimised, have you had discussions with the Chief Executive of Tusla yourself in order to give the proper kind of institutional um, um, direction to this kind of working? No, uh, Chair, I, don't, I haven't had any discussions, but I think uh, in the context of what we're trying to achieve, that it's something that has to happen. Uh, there are many issues that kind of impact on the effectiveness of those relationships, not least uh, maybe the coterminous aspect and, 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 and the basis that we all operate maybe have different boundaries and different borders, and that we may have some staff members of Angad Sheikhan who, who have to interact with two uh, TOSLA uh, groups or with two HSCs or whatever. So um, the, there are complications of that nature, uh, but of course there are many ways in which by proper dialogue and by uh, proper understanding of what the, um, when you go to the minutiae of the, of the recommendations of what they want to achieve, that that, that uh, discussion can achieve. I know that John uh, uh, O'Driscoll and, and his staff ha have lots of discussion at their level, but I mm -hmm. feel uh, you, you're right that, that, that to get a strategic view of it and to get, get rid of any possible impediments that may be there, that that is what is happening, yes. Okay, well, we'll leave that one with you. My second question is something that's um, maybe, excuse me, that is troubling me across the various items we've discussed today. You remember when we met uh, last year, we talked about, in the context of the work on fixed charge notices and breath tests and so on, we talked about 
manual summonses that went back to divisions and nothing happened. In the context of the child sexual abuse report from the inspectorate, we have 105 intelligence packages that went to divisions and nothing happened. In the juvenile diversion area, and I know Assistant Commissioner Leahy has said there's a review ongoing, but there's no denying a big proportion of the unsuitable cases, which went back to divisions for consideration of prosecution and nothing happened. Now, to me, that raises a potential question of a widespread governance risk for you as commissioner um, about the effective functioning of your divisional and district model and also about authority. So if things can disappear, there are two consequences, or maybe more than two, but there's at least an inherent unfairness that the people in the FCN land who paid up and took their penalty points or the young people in juvenile diversion who accepted their caution and went into a supervision arrangement. But the ones who ignored it, well, nothing happened. So could you maybe, would you agree with me that that is a big governance risk for the organization? Or am I adding apples and oranges? No, it is a big governance risk, Chair. And it's the one, uh, the risk that I have been uh, in face-to-face uh, correspondence or, or communication with all of my senior management on in the past few months. Um, to, to look at it in the context of all that we're trying to improve, uh, let it be from technology or through our structures, uh, and you mentioned the divisional model there, which has been piloted. <coughs> all of this is to ensure that we get to a situation where, you know, the, the, the issues that have been thrown up uh, of, of, of things going out and not being actioned, for example, that, we, we, that they will be flagged very, very early on for people. And if it's a question then of people just ignoring what has been told to them, you know, that that is not acceptable to me. I've made that very clear to all concerned. And where uh, the, the work we're putting into going over and, and looking at and examining where the issues are in the context of any of the issues that you've just raised there, where there is bad practice uh, or uh, where there's a, a bad approach or maybe just a bad attitude to the, con the context of something that needs to be done, that has to be addressed as a matter of urgency. Uh, where then it's a, it's, a, it's a structure issue or where it might be a systems issue, uh, you know, we are very busy in that space. And I think uh, over time we will be in a situation where we'll be well supported, both from a management point of view and a frontline uh, point of view, uh, in doing our job more professionally. But it is my job to ensure that despite all of that help, and I believe that it is coming, uh, that despite all of that, I, I would insist that everybody in a position of management would ensure uh, that you know, these things can't be ignored, and where they are, that the appropriate action is taken, uh, and, and taken very, very uh, swiftly. Have, have you any evidence of correlation across those examples of the same kind of behavior in in, in particular divisions. For example, and I am working from memory here, when we were doing the breath test work, there was a spectrum of divisions that had a modest uh, issue and ones that had a very large um, inflation figure. So I'm wondering, is there any correlation here? Are there divisions that ignore under all of these headings? Are there divisions, or is it spread around, or do you know? Well, from what I've seen so far, Chair, it's, it's, it's spread around. And, it, um, you know, there, could, there, there are definitely pockets of very good practice. And then there are, and, and even within some divisions, you can have districts that are operating very well and some that, you know, aren't at the same level. So I, what I've been challenging my own senior management team in the recent past with is to, to, to take the learning from this. Like, it's, it's very clear to look up at a map and see where you're, you're, you're operating well and where you're not and to find the common denominator and see, well, what is it that is not working here uh, in, in a division that has a similar profile maybe to the neighboring division, and yet you're getting uh, very different results out of the two divisions in the context of what we, we just talked about. Okay, well, maybe we might have so a look I've at that map with you sometime. Yeah, I've made a priority of that, and, and I'm aware that, uh, you know, all the work that's gone in, you know, we have to get the learning from it. I, mm -hmm. I'm not in a position putting uh, teams to, to examine uh, situations and then just having a report at the end of it. Okay. 
I want to get the learning out of it. I want to make sure that we see where the impediments are and that we can learn. Okay, and I want to emphasize that we also recognize and want to, and want to spread those good practices that you refer to. And that's really why we need to identify the black spots. It's not just about blame, it's about getting the good stuff spread into, um, into areas that are perhaps less well served. I know Deputy Commissioner Toomey wants to speak and then I'll move on. I, I just want to make two quick points just in relation to the earlier question, Chair. Uh, I know that, uh, or, I, or I believe that the, the, the Commissioner Coulon's predecessor uh, met with the, the head of TUSA at, at an earlier stage. Okay. And I know that, that I also met with the head of TUSA along with John at that, at that uh, government meeting that I, that I outlined. Just on a second point there that you're talking about, I think for, you know, we have mentioned on a couple of occasions th there is a weakness in terms of our policy ownership and where everybody owns it, nobody owns it. And I think there is a piece of work that we're expecting to be done in the next week or fortnight which will bring clarity around policy ownership. And I think that's the first step in then applying the governance uh, a re regime and framework around that. So uh, I think the point you make is well is well. I think is well what worth. I'm making is execution ownership. Yes, yes. I think, you know, it, as far as it goes, and in terms of the here and now, we yes. recognise the future. There are policies in place. Yes, yes. Uh, perhaps they could be improved, but they're, they're, they're yes. there. It's the execution is what I was focusing on yeah. uh, and, and not so much the policy, the execution governance. So if I might move on now to uh, our next agenda item, which relates to the public order issue in Nkosson. And uh, we're going to begin with Bob Collins. There, um, <clears throat> two things I want to say at the very beginning in relation to, uh, to this section. The first is that um, my purpose, our purpose uh, today is not to second guess or to offer alternatives to decisions that were taken um, back in whenever, in 2014. But it's to look at the at Assistant Commissioner O'Brien's report uh, on those events and to consider not the what, but the how. Uh, uh, how the decisions that were taken were implemented uh, on the day and the implications uh, of that. The second thing I wanted to say was that <clears throat> for me, and uh, I'll just speak for myself, uh, I think this, was a, this is a good report. Uh, it was clear, it was unambiguous, and it wasn't <coughs> afraid to be bold uh, and to be blunt. And that's always a good thing. But it doesn't paint a pretty picture. And it's important to recognise that too. When we spoke about this in February, we, we spoke based on the summary document that we had. And we expressed concerns and we were given many assurances. But reading the full document, or as full as it is, there were some minor redactions in it, reading that document, it reignites the concerns that we have, it seems to me, uh, and uh, raises a range of questions which I hope that Maureen uh, Linus and I will be able to uh, address uh, to you uh, insofar as time and the ocean that intervenes between us will permit. But erge dal chiesa commissioner beda gugaring kest dir gorsa kundi yarke person da olfui. And this is a question directly to, the, to you, commissioner. Do you agree with Assistant Commissioner O'Brien's uh, reports uh, analysis <coughs> and do you accept the implications of his report on these events? Yes, uh, Bob, I do uh, accept the report. Uh, it was comprehensive uh, and as you say it doesn't paint a pretty picture. Uh, but I think it's in, in the, um, the learning space that we are in uh, and this is another uh, learning curve for us in the context of how we uh, police certain events uh, and I think um, that what uh, the Assistant Commissioner found and what he has recommended uh, that I would be fully supportive of ensuring that they get uh, implemented as a matter of urgency. Well, it's, it's important to hear you say that because one of the things that was a source of concern was the responses that were sent to the authority Initial preliminary in character, I accept that, and, and brief to the 40-something recommendations that were in the report. 
Those re responses did not seem to suggest an urgency uh, in dealing with the recommendations that were made in the report. Many of them, the questions simply weren't answered. Many of them were referred back to the uh, MRP. Many of them were referred to something else. There was very little by way of engagement that said starkly, yes, we agree. Yes, we will do this. Yes, we will change. And it's important to hear you say that you accept the implications of the report, but by our fruits we shall be known. Uh, it, it will be even more important to see the recommendations being accepted and acted upon. And can I then, as a second part of that question to you, Commissioner, ask you whether you have had the opportunity or whether some of your senior colleagues have had the opportunity. I'm talking about the Deputy Commissioner and the Assistant Commissioner for the Dublin Metropolitan Region. Have had the opportunity to talk to the people who were involved in the operation on the day about the findings that were in this report, about the way in which decisions were taken. I personally haven't spoken to, to, to the people involved, um, Bob, but uh, um, I leave it to the other, uh, to the deputy and to the assistant commissioners for themselves. Um, obviously, uh, my first response has to be uh, to, to the report that was submitted to me uh, and to the co complex, sometimes, approach which is needed to resolve the issues and make sure they're implemented. In this space that we're in, where so much is happening, which is all towards improving the way that we do our, our job, uh, we have to be sure that we're not going out to uh, duplicate effort or to reinvent something that might already be in place. So there's a bit of due diligence required in that space, uh, and it's not in any way to, to, to uh, um, it may seem that it's the lack of urgency. But I think it's important that we give it that due diligence at the outset to ensure that we are uh, not, you know, duplicating effort, as I say, <coughs> and that we're getting the very best results. And where it needs a brand new approach, that that's what's, what's, what's going to be taken. And I know that Deputy Toomey has given this his absolute uh, commitment. He talks to me and reports to me on a weekly basis in the context of the major issues that he's dealing with in the context of operational policing and how we might improve it. Uh, and this is definitely one area that is very high up on, on the agenda. Uh, so, I, as I say, I, I haven't met with that team, but the, uh, the deputy and, and AC may answer for themselves. Uh, and I, I'm not talking. <clears throat> sorry, I'm not talking about attribution of blame or anything like that. I'm talking about the very point you made earlier about the quality of learning. And I know that the assistant commissioner wasn't in office at, at any stage during any of this, and indeed not uh, until after the court proceedings had been discontinued. The same is true for the for the divisional officer <coughs> in the area concerned. They weren't part of any of these decisions, so that's, that's not the tone of my question. It's to try to establish whether the learning that emerges from the report is being actively engaged with in discussions with the people who were there. And I recognise that decisions have to be taken on the ground, on the run, uh, in difficult circumstances, and I'm not second-guessing those decisions. It's the learning issue, and I'll come on to some other things in a moment. Um, maybe if I, if I can uh, attempt to answer that, uh, Bob. Um, I think we've said from very early on that we will take the lessons from all uh, reports that are provided for us, and whether, that, whether they are harsh lessons or otherwise, we have said we will be open about them and we will deal with them, and this is no different. I think we have implemented a number of the recommendations, and I know that AC Leahy can go uh, and deal with those. In the context of speaking to the people, uh, I've spoken to, to the AC that's currently there, and I've spoken to the, to, to, to the Chief Superintendent, and I've also spoken to the people that were there on the day and at the particular time. The report, you'll be aware from correspondence that, that has been provided to the authority, the report has been provided for them to both the, 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 the assistant commissioner and the divisional officer for them to go to deal with that uh, in, in, in some detail with the people who are, that, are, that were there, that, were out, that, are, that are still there uh, and that were there at that particular time. But in the context of uh, the divisional officer, in the context of the people that were there, I have spoken to them directly about that. I've spoken to them on a number of occasions since the report has, has come out. And in particular, I've spoken to the current assistant commissioner and the current team that are implementing the recommendations 
to do exactly as you say, ensure that the recommendations are implemented as fast as we can possibly m make them. I think we discussed the last day the, prog the progress on some of the implementation of, the, uh, of those recommendations. Well, I don't know whether you want to... to uh, uh, just to answer your direct uh, question, Bob, I haven't been in contact with the people that were there uh, at the time, as you rightly uh, pointed out. I took over this in June of 2017. The uh, most immediate things that uh, I identified uh, coming out of the report were, first of all, is there a policy uh, in place? And if there's not put one in place, that has been done. Is there an escalation policy in place? Uh, and if there's not put one in place, that has now been put in place. Is there an actual decision-making model that uh, the organization can actually use that would address some of the issues that were involved? That's now in place uh, also. In terms of training, do we have the required resources in place? Do they have the required training? Do they have the required equipment? All of that be has been addressed. And I think on our last meeting in relation to this, I pointed out to you that the biggest issue we had in terms of equipment was our transport uh, fleet, and that we were 15 vehicles uh, down. Uh, an order has been placed now for those 15 vehicles, so that was probably the largest thing from an equipment point of view <coughs> that was uh, hanging out there for us as a concern. So all of those issues have been addressed. Now, there are some longer-term issues that are in, as recommendations within the report, that are going to have to be dealt with uh, with a longer-term uh, approach to this, which will require a steering committee with all of the key players in terms of uh, training, investigation, and other uh, arms of the organisation that's going to be a longer-term approach. I've appointed um, a chair uh, in relation to that, uh, but in terms of getting the key actors around the table yet to pursue the rest of the recommendations, there are 44 in total, that uh, committee has not met yet because they were working on these front-facing uh, documents and policies and training in order to get ourselves into a place where we can say uh, a lot of what is in there has been addressed, but there are some longer-term issues to be addressed now. Thank you both. So, some of that is very encouraging, but <clears throat> in the same way that reading a map is no substitute for taking the journey, uh, writing a policy is no substitute for changing behaviours. <clears throat> and some of the things that the report says about the events on the day, about the way in which the operation was conducted, things like the incorrect parking of a car at the church, the fact that the entrances to the church grounds weren't secured, that a cordon wasn't properly placed around uh, the jeep in which the tarnishta was, uh, was um, <coughs> into which the tarnishta had been put. The fact that the public order unit, when it was um, called up, uh, fortunate that one was already preparing for an event in the three arena that evening, but that it arrived in, um, in, in a range of different vehicles. It was given the wrong rendezvous, uh, rendezvous point. Uh, it was poorly deployed, and as the report said, inevitably unsuccessful um, in those circumstances. I participated in a, a really first-class presentation um, led by yourself, Assistant Commissioner Leahy, about the public order practices of the organisation, which was impressive, and as I said to colleagues in a different context, open, frank, but there was a gulf of difference between that presentation and the reality as it's reported in Assistant Commissioner O'Brien's report. And that is something that isn't resolved, or is it, by the publication, uh, <coughs> by the enunciation of a policy. And Maureen may want to say things about, about training and other elements of the detail, but it raises troubling questions about the consequences of decisions that were taken in relation to training either for peaceful crowd management or public order in circumstances where 800 new Gardaí a year are coming into the system over these five years. That would be 4,000 new Garda members who will not have had training in crucially important areas and areas that may be more difficult in the future. And the test may much, be much more the spontaneous events rather than the planned events uh, for public order policing. <coughs> I, I think, th um, Bob, the, the training that you're talking about and the training that has, been on the, that has, that has taken place and the learnings that come, have come about 
will address some of the concerns that you're talking about. I think uh, um, Assistant Commissioner Leahy talked about the escalation process. He talked about a number of areas in terms of, of, of the deployment of the resources and how that can happen. And, and I would be you know, satisfied that, that, that the, the, the learnings that have come out of the report have fed into the revised training, have read in to the revised, there was a number of issues <coughs> identified in advance that should have been done in terms of, you know, in, in intelligence uh, opportunities where that should be improved. So I think there are a number of recommendations that, ha that have been introduced. Uh, and, and, and I think that, you know, there, is, there are difficult situations. And are we, are, are, can we sit here and say that, that, that a situation isn't going to arise down the road, that's something spontaneous, and that's going to be very, very difficult to contain? We can't. And I think we found ourselves in a situation on that particular day, and the people that were on the ground found that they had to manage it as the situation unfolded in front of them. And for sure they made mistakes and they got, they, they got some of them wrong. But I think that the, the training and the lessons will ensure that we minimise and we've mitigated the risks that are posed by both spontaneous and planned protests that will happen in the future. And, and I think that the lessons have been taken. And I think the lessons have been learned and have fed in to what has now an improved process and an improved policy and improved training, improved, improved de uh, deployment, improved escalation. And I think all of, those, all of those aspects that have been improved bit by bit will lead to, uh, uh, lead to an overall improved corporate response to these types of, of incidents. And you, you may consider this unfair and tell me if you do, <clears throat> because it may be. Um, when it's not intentionally unfair, but it may be um, a conclusion that isn't supported by uh, the evidence. But I have to say that the responses uh, today and the responses in February and the responses, the written responses to the recommendations that were in the report <clears throat> don't convey to me that sense of shock that there might have been in, at the most senior levels of the organisation in reading this report about the way in which the events were dealt with. And this is not an argument about people making dis decisions, because as we all know, the easiest thing to do is nothing. These are people who have to make difficult decisions in difficult circumstances. But some of them appear to me as a layperson to be so basic, so fundamental, so intrinsic to the kind of work that the Garda Shikana do every day of the week. I don't get that, I haven't got that sense, and that's why I qualify this by asking, is it unfair? I haven't got that sense of shock that you might have had when the commissioner and the deputy commissioner and the now assistant commissioner, any senior member of the, of the organization's leadership, got when they read this report uh, last, uh, almost six months ago. And if, if, if there has been this dramatic improvement in six months, well, that is a wonderful achievement. Well, I mean, I would probably say, Bob, that the, the presentation that you received uh, in, in the last recent time is an indication of the lessons that have been learned and, and the progress that we have made in terms of the implementation of those. I think from, from its outset, from the outset, the recommendation was accepted, and we immediately, if not even before that, uh, before the outcome of the final report, we had begun the progress of, um, of improving. And I think what you saw last week in, 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 in terms of the most recent presentation is the implementation of the lessons that we have learned. And, and I would argue we've learned a lot of lessons out of this. And I would, I would argue that how we deal with such incidents now is fundamentally different than from, from what it was previously. And that certainly is an indication of the seriousness that we have taken it. Thank, before handing over to, uh, to Maureen, might I just ask, say two things. One. The, the report, uh, the, the note that the Deputy Commissioner sent to the authority in December uh, talked about asking the Assistant uh, Commissioner and the uh, Division Officer, the Chief Superintendent, uh, for their um, uh, observations and recommendations. Uh, and three months later, uh, there were communications from both of them. But I, to me, it, those communications fell short of being comprehensive observations and comprehensive recommendations from the pr perspective of those two senior office holders uh, arising from the report. And I wonder when they might be expected to be available. And the, the second element is, when do you think that the section that was intended to be in the, re in the review in Assistant Commissioner O'Brien's report, dealing with the 
evidence uh, presented in the court proceedings, when will that begin to be addressed and when will that report be f available? Well, I, I might ask Barry to comment on the second part of it, but in, in terms of the initial comment, you, you will also be aware in that same correspondence that, 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 that the issue you have raised, that, that the correspondence was returned to the, the individual involved because it was accepted that it was understood that there was more information required. So it, it, uh, uh, it, yeah. before it landed here, that question had, had been asked okay. already, and we expect within a month that issue will be addressed. That, that, that conveys a much richer sense of the, of the, of the reply that they received. Thank you. Did you want to come in, Barry? Yeah, it's just, first of all, by way of maybe general observations, and I appreciate what, um, you know, the comments you've, you've made, Bob, about the report. Um, the, in respect of meeting the principles that were involved in the event, I, I might just refer to the fact that, that I, in my capacity, I actually met with them and I went over in detail maybe the, uh, the issues that uh, became obvious to me in ter terms of how it was, was conducted and obviously I invited them for further observations as to why that's so. Can I assure you that no, uh, you that was done in detail in respect of the individual actions of the principals surrounding this yeah. event? I knew, no, it was, it was since the publication of, uh, since the completion of your report, that was the issue. I, I knew that you had engaged with them. We talked about that in February in any yes. event. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks. that. Thanks, Barry. Uh, Maureen, if, if you can hear us, yes. I know you have some questions. Can you hear me? We can. Is that clear enough? Okay. Yep. Um, I, I'm going to follow on uh, from Bob. Um, a lot of my sentiments are similar, but I'm, uh, after the introduction, I'm going to deal with risk assessments, strategic control and communications, the training issue, and the invest investigation of the incident itself. Um, firstly, I agree it's a very good report, very thorough, and it doesn't pull any punches. But I do think there's one key shortcoming, if I may say so. It, it, it's very good and clear on recommendations, but the one recommendation that isn't in there, and this is consistent with the concern Bob has, is there is no proposal to remedy, uh, improve the functioning of public order in the Dublin mid uh, in in uh, the in in the region DMR uh, under discussion uh, by any means, uh, and I know it's called a qualified success, but as a reader, I I don't see it that way. Um, I, I will say that the report acknowledges the preservation of human rights and civil liberties, and some good tactical. Uh, police work, but in general, its description at all stages is of it was as a layperson inadequate police operations. So I reiterate what Bob said, and I reiterate it to the commissioner, and that is, I wouldn't be satisfied unless there is a program of remedy and improvement with this cadre of um, Gardaí. It's not to blame them, but there were Gardaí, there were supervisors, there were senior officers, there were 75 involved on the day, a full quarter of the complement in DMR. <coughs> and the issue has to be raised of how it got this way, and that's not to say mistakes don't happen, but the mistakes were, um, repetitive and um, significant in almost every aspect of the operation. And I, I don't think there's any getting away from that. And I'm concerned that policies and procedures, while new ones are needed and they have to be in place in order to enable the training that's required, I'm concerned that they don't address what were clearly functional inadequacies uh, with the handling of a very significant public order disruption. So, but don't know one, that's a question I have for you, is about addressing this in a remedial way. You, you, people don't just learn things unless there is a change in behavior and addressing this in a remedial way with that division. That goes comment. across oh, the yeah. board to all I can hear you. the I can learning see we have to, 
to all the learning we have to do in the context of lessons learned, not just in this particular um, event and the, as you say, the, ina the inadequate uh, functional approach on the, on the day. If I go back to the point that Bob made about the planned and the spontaneous, first of all, and just say, in a planned event, everyone is ready and people have done the risk assessments and they've had to be able to do that in, 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 in good time and have, have, their, have their plans made. In a spontaneous event, that you don't have that, you don't have that uh, luxury. However, I think the learning for the organization here is, what is a spontaneous event? This was one of many events that happened in the context of a particular issue at the time. And I think the learning here for uh, the management in particular, and from where I'm sitting, is that we have to be much quicker and earlier in our analysis of what might be emerging and in applying a planned approach to what we might be called a series of spontaneous events, but having people ready to respond in a certain way. Um, I believe in the context of what you spoke and said about that there was no proposal to remedy the functioning of, of the public order in the DMR, I'd be surprised if that isn't front and central in the context of what we are doing. And I'd, I'd leave it to, to John and maybe to, to Barry to, to outline that, but I, I'm, I'd be very confident that there's lots of work happening in that space, not just for the, the DMR units, because, because we have units right across the country. And this is where the policy and the approach has to be a standard approach. So where there's learning in one area, we need to, of course, get the remedial stuff in and get the learning from it. And yeah, like, the issuing of policy won't do that in itself. We need to get, um, you know, that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with the people who are on the ground to ensure that they understand what those shortcomings were on a particular date and to ensure that we get the learning from it. So, you know, there was lots of points in your question. I hope I've covered them. But I think uh, I'd yeah, say Barry or John would be able to give us a better uh, view of where we're at in the context of uh, ensuring we get the lessons learned, say, for the DMR unit and, and ensuring that that shortcoming is no longer there. Yeah, Donald, one of the things that I, I was disappointed <coughs> by, sim similar to Bob, is that I expected a response from the assistant commissioner, albeit I know he's new in that post, to the recommendations. That was not just about the recommendations, but in effect, a post, uh, a post event um, analysis and a post event uh, 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 assessment of what the learning has to be and what the organization and allocation of assignments need to be were a spontaneous event like this to happen again, and it will happen again. Uh, and so this is not, and particularly in the time that was in it, this was not an unusual event. It was, it was uh, very, uh, very vociferous and all the rest, and militant, but it was not an unusual event. And I'm disappointed that, the, and I don't mean to uh, highlight this assistant commissioner, but that the response we got was so lukewarm and I don't see it as anything other than that. Um, so again, I worry about where the emphasis is on urgency and priority. I'm not going to belabor this point because Bob has. Um, I'd rather move on, but um, it, it is of concern to us. And I would be very keen if at some point uh, Deputy Toomey could re revert to the um, uh, authority with what exactly has been done in DMR that is addressing the kind of inadequacies that demonstrated themselves uh, in regard to this protest. If, if I could maybe just make a comment um, on that more. If I can move on then to risk assessment. And again, the report here is very clear. Um, is that okay? Yep. Okay. Um, one is the lack of intelligence, and the, abs and the other is the absence of any reliance on social media. And the report points out uh, a couple of things. One, that there were two similar events 
in the uh, immediate, uh, 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 just immediate to, to the uh, occurrence that occurred on the day out in Jobstown, uh, number one. Number two, that there was no recourse to social media, although the event itself was posted on social media and um, in, uh, with uh, invitations uh, for people to attend. Um, the report makes clear that the risk management was absent in advance of the event, and it was a planned event, the, the Tonishta did not just appear. Uh, the uh, local guard of station knew she was coming. Uh, but it also points out that it was unclear who in Garda Shiakana is responsible for intelligence assessments. So this is a larger question than the question of who locally did or didn't identify um, intelligence on the day. So I, I think we can say that was a missed opportunity for sure, uh, number one. And number two, uh, who in Ungarda Shiakana is now responsible for intelligence assessment uh, when public events are organized? Uh, Deputy if I, if, I, if I can maybe answer that. Um, I think, uh, I suppose, that the, the, if I could come to the, the question you asked at the end, uh, Maureen, the Assistant Commissioner of Security and Intelligence is the person who is directly responsible for the assessment uh, uh, of any available, the gathering and the assessment of all, all intelligence uh, in the organisation. And he would work with a local divisional officer or district officer, depending on the nature and the scale and the extent of the, of the event that is being dealt with. So in this particular incident, if this were to happen now, um, the district officer would liaise with the Assistant Commissioner of Security and Intelligence and that complete assessment would be done. Um, in addition, you, you, you posed a question in relation to the open source intelligence again. That, that capacity has now been provided to the uh, Assistant Commissioner in Security and Intelligence. In the immediate aftermath of, of the event, um, there was a, a unit specifically set up to deal with that and to deal with those issues as they were arising uh, in the Dublin metropolitan region. And um, that, was that was in operating within the DMR, but under the strategic uh, control of Assistant Commissioner of Security and Intelligence. That has now been developed further. The capacity and capability has been developed further. And, and that Assistant Commissioner has clear responsibility for, for, for the intelligence gathering and assessment, uh, both online and, and through every other uh, opportunity that's available. Did you want to go and back to the previous question before, while you have the floor? I'll come back to it at the end. Okay, thank you. Maureen? Okay. J John, is that since this happened, or was there, that, or did that post exist at the time? Uh, no, it was set up in the immediate aftermath uh, of, of, of this uh, event. Okay. And, and, and so how would intelligence have been handled? There were many water protests at the time. Uh, how would the intelligence have been handled in, in, in advance of that then? Um, I'm, I'm just slightly concerned, Maureen, about going into, uh, you know, that, that level of detail, um, uh, you, you know, uh, that's very much an operational matter. Um, and I, I, I'm just reluctant to go into so much detail. But, but suffice to say that there are people uh, detailed um, and there is people with responsibility for that role and function. And following that event, I think that the particular area that you've outlined and, and that has, you have discussed in terms of the online piece, I think that has been enhanced and, and that has been improved. Can I just by way of assistance um, just mention one or, one or two things? Um, as, as the deputy has said, it's always a dangerous area to start going down specifically in respect of intelligence. And the purpose of my report was kind of give an overview of the strategic issue. And really what I was endeavouring to do in the report was to suggest that it was in the absence of analysis of the information that was in the domain at the time was lacking. Not necessarily because sometimes <coughs> we can mistake the issue of intelligence as being a specific piece of intelligence that a likely event is to take place. 
but in this instance, there was a series of events that clearly indicated that there was a greater risk of such an event taking place. And that's the, that was the intelligence gap that was there. And in fairness to what the deputy has said, uh, there has been a structure put in place that specifically looks at that in the Dublin metropolitan region and also in a number of regions. For example, in my own region, in the northern region, we do have a specific unit that is tasked with the tasking and coordinating of intelligence as opposed to the actioning of intelligence upon receipt. There's a slight difference in respect to that. The other point I would make, and Maureen, you, you said it about the, uh, the issue about the Dublin metropolitan region. I was conscious in my report not to refer to the Dublin metropolitan region because this is potentially an issue uh, that could happen in any region in the country. So the purpose of the recommendations is not to address an issue in a particular location because you have to be fair to them because the fact that the event took place there doesn't of necessity mean that it will take place there again. So the point being that the recommendations were to cover the rest of the country as well. Just if I might, Chair. Well, I, I understand that, I understand that but I, I, I think it's fair to say that whatever region was um, blessed with this kind of um, um, uh, disorder uh, had to be prepared for it. And um, in this case, it's, it's, it was the DMR. And, that, and our point is simply <coughs> that retrospective um, uh, a program of learning and improvement is absolutely essential, that it won't just happen by instituting a new procedure. I think that's all we've been trying to say on that score. Um, uh, my next question has to do with strategic control and communications. The report also highlights there is no evidence of strategic control and communications occurring with the Garda Communications Centre at Harcourt Square, which I have to therefore assume is unusual uh, from the, the way that it's cited in the report. There is also no evidence of an attempt to have the hostage barricade uh, critical incident unit activated uh, to assist and be deployed and no record of advice is being sought from the crisis uh, negotiating team. So again, it would seem that in a major incident where 75 Gardaí were involved at different levels, that there were issues that I, I, I think would help if it were clarified, how did this happen? What is normal operating procedure? Um, and the last point that uh, the report cites is that the, the dedicated uh, radio channel for communications in such instances was not used. Instead, the communications were over an informal or two or three different uh, frequencies. So can I ask um, uh, what should be normal operating procedure and how did it occur that that kind of contact and ongoing oversight by Harcourt Street did not occur? Yeah. Hi Maureen, Pat Lee here. Maureen, Hi, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that uh, a lot of the uh, issues that you've raised haven't been brought to your attention in terms of what has been put in place because the, di di uh, the digital intelligence, intelligence unit has been in place now since that event uh, took place and that was a part of the response that went back describing that. And equally, the uh, policy that has been developed deals with the strategic management or the lack of strategic management that was there at the time and uh, is in place now. And it also deals with the communication aspect that you're, you're raising uh, at the moment. It deals with ownership, responsibility, <coughs> it deals with de declaring the uh, incident to be a uh, public order incident that requires a different response. All of that is there and all of that was um, communicated during a recent presentation. Yeah, but Assistant, the... Assistant Commissioner, I, I've read the recommendations and I've, I've read every piece of documentation that we've been given on this. So I understand that these new arrangements are in place. The fact of the matter is, at the height of disputes 
and public order difficulties in the water charges uh, protests. That pr procedure did not operate. And my question is, why did it not operate? And all the finest procedures in the world, if there's something fundamental that is not being done at local level, then all the procedures in the world are not going to sort that. So my question is, do you know why that didn't happen on the day? No, and nobody's disputing with Jim Maureen that it didn't happen on the day. I'm responding, I suppose. But do we know? Do we know why it didn't happen on the day? Well, I think a lot of that was outlined in the actual uh, report itself, and it showed where the uh, difficulties were and the deficiencies were. And we've acknowledged that, and we've, in fairness, the commissioner has accepted the recommendations and the findings in the report. But uh, the first set of questions were: out, What have we done since? And all of that has been communicated, and part of the uh, discourse today is about uh, a disappointment at the communication and the, what was in those communications. But there are a series of communications that have taken place between ourselves and the authority over the last while, and all of those issues have been uh, addressed and outlined what has actually taken place, what has been done since. So, yeah, but I yes, know that. everybody accepts that it didn't I, happen on the day, but they're in but place what now. We're looking at but, Assistant Commissioner, what we're looking at is what happened on the day. We're looking at a forensic analysis of what happened on the day of that protest. And in the best of all worlds, the normal chain of command and control broke down. And I'm asking, do we know why that happened so it doesn't happen again? Yeah, and we're accepting that, Maureen, because the processes and procedures that are now in place weren't in place at the time. That's one answer uh, to it. Uh, in fairness to Barry, has done the uh, report and has come back and identified lots of those uh, issues for us and those uh, deficiencies, and they simply weren't there. The processes and procedures and the policy wasn't in place at the I, time. I, I think, if I may interrupt for a second, I think, I think you're missing something, Assistant Commissioner. The report outlines what happened and what didn't happen, and it identifies things that didn't happen. It's the same point I made earlier about execution of current policies. You certainly have put in place new policies. But we're, we're not clear from the report why the existing, the then policies, the then practices, the then radio point that Maureen is making. It's the why question because all of your new policies will face the same risk if you don't understand what happened between policy and execution. Is that fair, Maureen? Is that a... That's, it. That's yeah. exactly fair. Yeah, the implementation of the new policies is a job of work that needs to be done for us. It's about communicating, and as it, uh, as it arose earlier on, it's about communicating it to the front line that the guards that are going to be deployed on the day and the officers that are in charge are actually going to use the policies. So there's a communication process that we have to engage in now, having put them in place to make sure that people are actually going to engage them and use the policies and procedures that are now in place. They simply weren't in place at the time the policies. But somewhere. Were, can, Sorry, Bob. No, just to try to express the dilemma we have in a slightly different way. <clears throat> On the 14th of November 2014, the day before this event. I think that the senior leadership of the Garda Síochána would have considered it inconceivable that the list of problems that arose the following day could possibly have arisen. It would not be believed that there wouldn't be any seen decision logs. It would not be believed that there would be such a little use made of the communications that was available. It would not be believed that the level of strategic engagement um, might not have been as effective as it was, and so on and so on and so on. And the difficulty is none of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's my, with the point I made earlier about reading the map and taking the journey. That I accept the fact, we do absolutely recognise the work that has been done in terms of the identification of new policies, the articulation of proper procedures. It is the certainty particularly in circumstances where no guard coming out of Temple Moor and 4,000 will in the course of these five years has had any training in peaceful crowd management or in public order. How can that confidence be there that 
what are, I have no doubt, really good policies, carefully thought through, integrated, cohesive, how can there be reasonable satisfaction that they'll be implemented when something unforeseen happens tomorrow? They're certainly been uh, included and have been included in the public order training for the current cadre of public order people, <coughs> and that amounts to 1,267 odd people, so that's in included in that training. Uh, discussion has taken place with the director of training in the college to have it incorporated into the training for the new entrants into the organisation. That's what I can tell you in terms of the training at this with the uh, crowd management training. Could I maybe, Bob, maybe just try and, uh, and maybe try and unpick uh, the, the, the situation? I think what we had on that day was, was a decision that was probably made in isolation. And I think that cannot happen as we sit here today. I think there was a decision made at a point in time to, to bring an approach to this, uh, an approach as to, uh, as to what was considered to be the best approach as to how the, the people on the ground would deal with the situation that they faced. If that was to happen today, that decision would not be made in that you would have, the, Maureen uh, mentioned the communication centre. They have a specific role now in the decision making that they did not have at the particular time. So similarly, does, it, does an enhanced and, and a stronger escalation process? So, so the, the clarification of the incident, but I think it does stem from the fact that perhaps there was, a, there was a decision on the day in isolation which cannot happen now, and that was one of the key critical learnings that come out of it. And our command and control centre cannot, it cannot be done in, in isolation or in absence of, the, of, of them. I know Maureen has a list of questions, so I want to let her back in. I hijacked your time. Yeah, I'm sorry. 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 So, uh, do I, uh, I'm going to ask to um, just a comment and a very quick question. Is that okay? Yes, please. Is that okay, Josephine? Yes, that's fine, Maureen. Go ahead. Okay. I mean, Bob has raised the lack of training at the Garda College. That's apparently been in place now. Um, in, in, excuse me, in crowd control since uh, the recession. And we understand the range of cuts that you have, um, and that is being instituted again. My question is, um, for those Gardaí who are serving now, who have come through the college in that period, will they be exposed to public order training in some form uh, in the foreseeable future? I would suggest no, Maureen, not in any large numbers. I mean, what we uh, have is we have uh, a minimum resource requirement for public order across the state at the moment. And that breaks down uh, to, and this will be very quick, 228 in the DMR and 76 in each of the other regions. Now, in order to deploy those levels, we have to train double that number. Now, we've reached that number. We've just over 1,200 members uh, trained across the nation uh, at the moment. But to get into training, outside of the Templemore environment with people who are not going to be in the public order unit, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. It's going to take a little bit of time to get into that space. One reason is because the pipeline for training in the college is quite difficult, whereas we do our own training outside in terms of public order. We're trying to get what we have up to a certain standard at the moment before we get into maybe a day or a half day training in soft code management. So yes, it will happen, but it's going to take a little bit of a while. A little bit of time. So it will happen? I would expect absolutely. It's certainly going to happen in the college. We've, also, we've already been in discussion with the director of training there. Uh, outside with no, people... No, for, out for the people who have finished the college. They haven't engaged in that training outside of the college yet unless they have actually joined the public order unit. And we have okay. 1,200... So that means, for example, the 75 Gardaí who were involved in the day, on the day in Jobstown would not be privy to that training. I would suggest no, unless they're members of the public order unit have joined since. However, they have received uh, basic training in, in control and restraint at the Garda Co College as part of the basic training. Yeah. Can I just also okay, say my that? final question, my final point is the final section of, of the report. Uh, and again, the report is very good. Um, speaks to the lack of a formalized and strategic approach to the subsequent investigation and the failure around routine procedures. Things such as, and it goes into detail, the jobs books, the recording decisions, the oversight of 
management of statements and the appointment of a senior investigating officer. Um, <coughs> on the day, it was clear that this was a um, highly political with a little p um, uh, protest uh, with um, very um, uh, severe tensions, um, uh, the detainment of a tarnishta, and I am, I, I, I'm interested in your explanation as to how this happened, that the investigation protocol was not followed uh, to a, uh, a higher degree than it was on the day. So and again, the question that? becomes, how do you avoid it in the future? Uh, I think in respect of the investigation, um, the, the, the detail of the report you're alluding to there goes into the very minute detail that I tasked the investigators to look at. And the conclusions were that the investigation was robust. And I think, you know, although they pointed out certain what I would describe as housekeeping issues, these were not fundamental to the success of the investigation. And, you know, if we're going into that minute of detail, you know, the purpose of this report was to inform an organization internally of the learning that had to be made as a consequence. Now, the investigation, to be fair to the investigators, they conducted a robust investigation. But there were a number of technical housekeeping issues that were at variance to our policy. It didn't affect the fundamentals of the investigation, but they are matters that are within our policy that weren't adhered to. And I think that we have to be fair to the people who were involved in the investigation. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm, I, I, I'm more than keen to be fair, and the report does point out some very positive ways that uh, this was handled uh, in the process of, of the protest. Uh, I did not read that section of the report the way you just described. So if, 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 it's, if, if the emphasis is not what you intended, I, 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 I apologize. But, excuse me, that is not how I read it. It seemed to have much more emphasis um, than what you're just describing. Um, that being said, those are my questions. Uh, it's, not a pretty, it's, it's not a pretty picture, as Bob said. And our concern remains that what happens in future is different, and it's different because there is learning and understanding of practice uh, at, at very local level, and that the operating policies and procedures are followed. And I think it's fair to say it wasn't on the day. We're not trying to flog a horse. We know these things happen unexpected and with great tension. Um, but uh, I think we would have to say, and you would have to say, that this report does not reflect well on what happened, uh, on how the Gardaí conducted that day. Um, and that's all I have, Josephine. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Deputy Commissioner Toomey wants to come in, but I also want to draw your attention to, I think there was a question left over from Bob Collins that wasn't answered about the court performance aspects of the review, Bob, if I'm correct. I think you posed that question. Did you get an answer? Yes, that yeah, actually sorry. wasn't answered. I, 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 okay, sorry. I, had I, I obviously wasn't paying close enough attention. John? Uh, I had intended to answer that aspect of it. As you're aware, that at the last meeting, that was the outstanding matter. Um, I, have, I have looked at it, uh, and I have consulted with the Office of the DPP in relation to the matter. Uh, it would be fair to point out that there are a number of technical and policy issues in respect <coughs> of that aspect of it. Um, particularly in relation to um, the appropriateness of us on Garda Shikana conducting an investigation into a matter which is within the realm of the courts. Uh, and as well as that, there is the other issue in respect of how practically we could obtain the material with which we can advance that. Well, we might, uh, we might have another word about that yeah. in due course. Um, is, Deputy Commissioner Toomey, yeah. you wanted to say something. I, I, I suppose I'll ju I just want to go back to, to a couple of general uh, comments I, 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 I would take it. Um, when, when incidents of this nature, or when any, any serious incident uh, happens, 
it is normal practice that a report is provided by, by the district or the divisional officer or, or the command in that case. Such was the seriousness of this case. There was an independent uh, assistant commissioner appointed in Assistant Commissioner O'Brien. So any suggestion that the organisation um, didn't take it seriously, you know, I think in, in the context, Maureen, of the, of, the, of the earlier comment, I think the organisation took this really, really seriously and appointed Assistant Commissioner O'Brien. And we have taken the lessons, harsh and all, as, as, as they are, uh, and we believe that, that that has led to an improved uh, approach to public order policing in the country. And I think that needs to be kept in mind. I think, uh, in, in, in addition to that, um, Assistant Commissioner Leahy outlined earlier on the various different training and the different aspects that have changed and that have been implemented, both from a, a command perspective, from, a, from an incident escalation perspective, from, from a communications perspective, and from the public order training. So I think all of those uh, aspects combined, certainly I hope, give assurance to the authority that the issue was taken very, very seriously, and that lessons were learned and improvements have been made. Bob? Just a final word for me. I, I never questioned uh, the fact that the uh, incident uh, was taken very seriously. Uh, clearly, it, it, it would have had to have been taken seriously, given its character, and it evidently was with the appointment of Assistant Commissioner O'Brien to conduct the investigation. On the specific issue of the um, presentation of evidence in the district court, the interest that the authority has in this is not in any sense uh, to um, uh, trench upon the grounds of the courts or to uh, step into their arena. But as the report itself said, that the fact that the proceedings were unsuccessful um, is a measure of, a lack of, of the lack of success. And that one of the crucial elements, and I'm not specifically focusing on this particular case, but in general, the quality and robustness of the presentation of evidence in court proceedings is a critical element of the, of the justice procedure and the successful prosecution of cases where um, successful prosecution is warranted. Um, and it would be a great pity, to put it more strongly than that at this stage, if the Garda Shikana weren't going to consider that issue simply because of some apprehension that somebody might have that this would be in some way to... Um, step into the territory of the courts uh, because that's not the point that's not the issue there must be there must be an interest it seems to me in the Garda Shikana in general on um, and again I'm not talking about this particular case on the quality and robustness of the presentation of evidence in court I, I think the chair said that, that it might be something we might revisit and I think that certainly mm. would be welcome that we can deal with this more comprehensively I th I'm reminded of um, a previous conversation we had here where the commissioner had referenced, you know, successful court convictions as the real measure of performance in the Gardaí. And it's in that context yeah, yeah, yeah. that this discussion, as Bob has said, um, would take place. Um, <coughs> Pat Costello is going to ask a couple of questions in a moment about the Commissioner's monthly report. But I just have maybe an observation um, and a question for the Commissioner before we move on. One of my hobby horses, of course, about data quality is yet again on the table. And um, it's, this is a comment, really, but I don't want it to go unremarked. Child sexual abuse report. Entries going in too late. We have found in the past that part of the explanations for us is officers having putting in, uh, because, for reasons outside of their control, sometimes putting in material too late but 22% of the child sexual abuse records being entered more than a month late. Memories can't be good when that happens. So there are behavioral aspects to data entry in all of the documents before us today, including the Jan Cusson report, including the child sexual abuse one, including the juvenile diversion one, that I just want to underline that we have noticed. And we're looking at these as horizontal issues running across your work and uh, we're going to keep doing it. The question I have has to do with basic training. We've made an observation before about driver training. Today we have um, a recommendation, and, and Assistant Commissioner Leahy, who I know has important business in Christchurch and he had to leave, um, made the point that you've been speaking to the college. But how can you attest a guard? 
out of Templemore who hasn't done a one-day course in peaceful crowd management and hasn't passed driver testing. This is the, you know, this is, there's a fundamental issue here. This is not about the special units that Pat spoke about. It's about a basic baseline level of police craft that kind of troubles me, and it's coming up a number of areas. And as Bob pointed out, you have huge number of guards. So the bucket is continuing to fill with new recruits that don't tick these two boxes. And there's probably 22 more when I find them. So would you like to make a comment about the basic training and the risks you're That's storing you up mean. for yourself? Yeah. Commissioner, please. Yeah, uh, these, uh, the two matters you brought up, for sure. Um, you know, we have to keep an eye to our basic training in the context of the issues that were raised. And I think we went from a scenario where, uh, when I was training, we all got public order training in the context of, of uh, you know, public order incidents of uh, where you needed to use a baton, etc. Uh, and then we specialised and we created the public order units, which had to be well equipped and all the rest of it. So it meant that everyone couldn't get that level of training. But I accept that there must be some minimum level of awareness, even in the context where they may have to work side by side with a, a fully equipped public order unit. And I think that is quite doable within the context of our, our syllabus. Uh, the driver training is one, and I know that John has lots, done lots of work in this space. It is a cause of continuous frustration for ourselves. Uh, that we are in a position that we cannot, you know, even put a, a driving license qualification to, that, that the people that are joining Garda Shikhan should be fully qualified drivers. Uh, th that's not part of what uh, we ask when, when, when the, the ads go out. So there, there are lots of areas that can, that can be looked at in the context of getting even, as you say, a one day or a one week within the, within the framework of our training uh, which would deal with certain elements of driver training. But it's a much broader uh, and a much bigger demand uh, when, you, when you try to get people up to a level where they can, for example, be involved in pursuit. So uh, we've tried a few ways in which we could remedy that. And I know that John can give you detail on that, but it, it's, it's not lost on me the, 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 the frustration that you've, you've raised there in the context of our basic training and why these things don't form a fundamental element of that. And we are awaiting uh, a response to some queries about the outsourcing of basic driver training. We absolutely accept the distinction between basic and pursuit. We know the difference. It's the basic we're, we're waiting for some uh, material from you on. So I'm going to move on now to Pat Costello on the Commissioner's Monthly Report. Pat. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome the report. Uh, the report, I think, has continued to evolve and it's now a very, very significant docu document of 30 pages plus with very, very, very uh, useful information and thank you for that. Um, second thing I want to say is the covering note from yourself, uh, Deputy Tommy, I, I noticed uh, and I welcome it again, um, the workplace portal page. And this is where, as you say, all information in relation to self-care, mental health, physical health, bereavement, family and so on can be accessed. So I'm just wondering uh, how that is going. Has it been well welcomed? And has it been rolled out uh, to all members and available to all members at this stage? Uh, um, the, 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 the portal page is available uh, to everybody um, and every, everybody that has access to it. Uh, as I said, and as, as it attempts to allude to here, it is evolving uh, and, 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 and the use is beginning to grow. And I think the, the, the space where we want to get to will be that it's, it's, it's seen as a reservoir of information and it, it's, seen, it's seen to provide real benefit and assistance and what the, an area that people can look to to, to to assist them. You know, the area you've touched on and you, and, and, and you refer to it is of real concern and it's something we want to continue to improve. We've had lots of discussions with different people as we go around the country on how and how we can further improve it, and those recommendations are, fe are feeding in. It is evolving, it's continuing to improve, and we, we look to okay. well, I think it's very much to be welcomed, given that uh, your day-to-day -day job can be very challenging and stressful at times, so we we'll welcome that. Um, maybe a question for the Commissioner, if you can, if you can hear me. It's on finance, and uh, I suppose it's a very, very important issue. And at the end of March, the report says you were 11 million euro over budget, and that over time, 
was 4.9 million over budget to date, that's by March. I suppose my question is, you know, how is this going to be brought back on track? Um, and over time, you know, how is that, how is it controlled and how is it going to be brought back on track? I think it's very, very important to have strong financial control. So I'd like to get your reaction to that, please. Yes, Josh, well, uh, this has been on our senior leadership team uh, agenda uh, every meeting since uh, last October, in fact, was we didn't wait for the new financial year to start putting controls in place. Uh, however, there are demand led issues that will, uh, at times, no matter how much controls you have or how well you manage, and I, we, I have to say we have seen uh, a lot of uh, um, cutbacks in areas and a lot of, of uh, prudent management by lots of managers. But uh, if you uh, have a run of major investigations or of uh, incidents that require um, people to come in of, uh, that the, the roster units can't cope with, then uh, the overtime is the only the only out. Now, uh, we are in the first, uh, I suppose, after the first quarter of the year, we were over budget. Uh, we have uh, revised and renewed our approach through our finance, and, and Joe Nugent is there and can talk to it maybe in more detail in the context of how we can uh, get further savings. Uh, and that is a, a major priority for us uh, as we approach, uh, you know, but, you know, some aspects of overtime or some aspects of demand are seasonal and then uh, other things just happen uh, spontaneously where you have to react. Uh, but uh, in the overall context, it is something that I'm keeping very square in front uh, of all of my managers and all the ACs to ensure that they're, they're uh, applying all the necessary controls uh, to bring us back uh, within budget. Uh, at the earliest possible opportunity. And uh, do you think uh, you will get back on budget? Or um, I suppose the last couple of years has been a supplementary budget, or is there an assumption, well, look, there will be in a supplementary budget? My own view is I don't think you should assume there will be a, su a supplementary budget. I think it's incredibly important to have strong financial controls where you can achieve efficiencies, set priorities, and get value from money. Um, and you know, when you have a track record of good financial controls, and that does always improve your case of getting funding for projects, and there are a lot of projects you want to do. So uh, I just get the feeling, um, I suppose the feeling, I suppose what I see, or what I think I see anyway, is that you know, financial controls are, are weak and certainly could be a lot stronger. I just wondering, would you agree with that? Pat, can I, maybe if I can take... No, I think, yeah. Maybe let the, if let the commissioner... Sorry, maybe commissioner. First, yeah. Sorry, I, I thought I heard someone well come in. Um, what I'd say is um, there, there, there will there'll be no supplementary uh, budget. We, we've been made aware of that since last year. That has been my mantra at every management meeting, that we're not just assuming that this is going to happen at the end of the year. That message got through to all the senior managers, and they're cascading that down to the front line in the context of uh, making sure they control what they're getting. The components that drive this uh, and that, uh, you know, there are elements of even in increased, getting increased numbers of Gardaí out of Templemore and onto the street, believe it or not, has a, an upward push on some elements of our overtime budget in that the more people you have active, the more people you have going to court, the more people then you have to bring back in to go to court when they're required, if they're required on a, on a, day's, on a day's rest. So it's a very complex picture, but as I said, Joe has, has been working with, with our uh, finance director and his team throughout the country and in all our areas, our operational areas, to ensure that we have proper and stringent controls in place. And I think we can point to areas where th that approach has worked. We have, had made, we have made savings in lots of areas, but there are some other elements uh, due to the exigencies that have uh, happened in the context of the last few months that have pushed that uh, uh, above uh, the, 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 the limit in the context of our management of our budget in the first four months of the year. Okay, Commissioner, thank you. I might leave it, uh, unless you have something to add, I might leave it at that, given the time of the evening it is. And uh, thank you for the comments and thank you for the reassurances. Um, Sorry, later on. Deputy Toomey wants to okay. come in at the end. Go ahead. I do want to um, mention um, Appendix C of the report, and it does talk about policing successes, and I want to welcome that and acknowledge uh, the successes that you've had. And I think it's very, very important that that press briefing that uh, Assistant Commissioner O'Driscoll gave, and I noticed now you're having a regional office in 
in the south and the southern region. So I think that's all, that's all good in terms of giving uh, confidence to the general public that you're making progress and being successful. So in the very short time you have, done, John, do you want to make comment on that, particularly, I think, in your fight against organised crime? Do you want to give us any assurances on how you're winning that battle? Well, indeed, uh, and the financial end of things comes into this also in that, to an extent, one could argue we've taken a risk in that we believe we had the capacity because of the level of intelligence that we have gathered to tackle organised crime in a much more impactful manner. Uh, and we put significant resources into targeting specific people. Some of those have been caught and some of those operations have been specifically costed and that information provided to the deputy who has provided onwards to the department to explain the expense involved. But we believe that uh, the success that has been achieved in this first quarter may well reduce the level of overtime required later in the year. There is a bit of an element of risk in doing that, but uh, there are indications that the success achieved in the first quarter may help in that regard. But uh, the reorganisation ari uh, arising out of the modernisation and renewal programme, the restructuring of organised crime units uh, within special crime operations, uh, the assistance which those units provide then to, out to the regions and the combination of uh, my resources along with Michael O'Sullivan's resources in security and intelligence has put together a much better package in terms of dealing with organised crime and I think that has been a major contributory factor uh, and you know, better allocation of resources, very focused allocation of the resources that have been made available to us. So we hope that that success can be maintained throughout the year and, and that uh, the uh, organised crime groups will react in a manner that okay. will reduce the level of threat to life in particular. I just want to acknowledge the progress and, and the success you've had in that, in that area. Just moving on quickly to the policing plan, there are a few negatives in that and a few reds, if you like, not on track. I suppose uh, civilisation we always talk about and I note that 49 members, only 49 Garda members, are being, have been reassigned out a target of 500 for the year. So I don't know if I see that. Maybe it's Joe, is that yours? Uh, I think, think you're going to meet the target of 500? <clears throat> no, I do believe we are continuing to make progress. It is slower than we had hoped, but as much as this, or as, er, or as earlier as er, er, Tuesday of this week, the executive considered um, a specific set of posts that should be designated uh, immediately as civilian-led positions and that the individuals currently in those posts will be redeployed. I'm conscious that the, the nature of the post haven't been communicated to the representative bodies yet, so I won't get into the detail of it here, but, but certainly that in, in itself will have an impact on increasing the numbers over, over the coming weeks and months. So, you know, we, we are looking at this in a very um, serious way. We meet with uh, our HR director and his staff um, on a fortnightly basis to assess progress and it was in that context that we made that decision around uh, around identifying very specific particular posts. It's obviously we welcome if you make the 500 and that then and with, that's a good result so thank you for that uh, confirmation. Another uh, negative if you like was the Garda Reserves uh, that was a red the recruitment of Garda Reserves and also the Garda Reserve strategy you know when is that going to be developed uh, you know, one of, the, one of the great strengths of Vanguard Shikana is the commitment individually to your local community. And then you have people in the local community want to uh, commit to being a Garda Reserve. So I think it is a, a great opportunity uh, for you. So just wondering where you are on that, how are you doing on Well, I think Garda ACD and unfortunately had to leave and, and he has responsibility for that uh, area under his community engagement and public safety space. So perhaps if we ask him to reply to you over the coming a uh, couple of weeks, uh, Pat, so that and we can have a more engaged discussion around that issue at our next at our next meeting. Yeah. if that's okay. From the senior management team, do you do you see it as a priority? To me, it oh, seems no, uh, an old brainer. It. it is an absolute priority, Pat, and I think re recruitment in this area, you know, the, the, the is starting, and there are some people expected to to be uh, commence training in the near future. But I think in order to deal with it properly, we we, we should provide a, a comprehensive report on it. But be clear, the reserve is an important part of the organisation. Um, Sorry, Pat, may I interrupt yeah, you a second? Yeah. Just, just on that point. We, we are aware that there is a draft. Yes. So absolutely. it's a question of Great. when will it stop being a draft? Well, when I, will it actually be finalised and then 
We, you know? we, we have taken on board observations of a number of people and okay. that's, that's been finalised. So the strategy isn't, is, isn't too far away. It has to be a little bit more visionary uh, and that was one of the key, the, the key aspects that, that were uh, identified to us. But it's, 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 you know, in a matter of weeks. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Pat. That's good. The Code of Ethics, uh, really, really important, obviously, for government, the general public. And I note that 4,000 members now have had face-to-face -face training and workshops and welcome that. But the target is that everybody will have had it by the end of July. I know Pat isn't here, but how do you think you're doing on that? And maybe how has it been received? How are the workshops being received? Uh, Any information I, I, on that? I think it's been received very well. Um, I, I think training is ongoing. It, it is difficult to give an exact timeline as when it will be finished. But I think one thing we need to remember is the Court of Ethics uh, is, is really doing, uh, it's been very, very well received. Uh, it is codifying a lot of our actions and behaviours. Um, I think there's a, there, there is another opportunity, and I, I was in the Garda College yesterday, where I had the opportunity to meet with, with the training staff around not only the, the Court of Ethics, but also the culture audit. And as we're aware, the, the findings of the culture audit will be made public uh, in the very near future. So I think there are real opportunities and the real benefits. Uh, the Commissioner and, and, <coughs> and, and the CAO and myself have done a, a series of, of what we're calling town hall meetings. And we visited eight divisions. And at every opportunity, we've talked about the Code of Ethics, about the, 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 the uh, culture audit, and about the values, and about living up to those, and in every place it has been really, really well received. Uh, our people are clear, and I think what it does, the Code of Ethics provide uh, that real opportunity to, to remind people, and we all need reminding every day of, 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 of our core values, but I, I think that certainly I'm very excited about what, 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 what the next uh, okay. year or so provides in terms of values, culture, human rights, and ethics. I think it's going to be really, really important that all members sign not just that they have received the copy, that they have received the training, but also that they will abide by the code. I think it's really, really important that that happens, that it's all done. And then it'll be a wonderful statement that you, the Commissioner, can make that everybody in Angarthi Shikana is committed to abiding by the Code of Ethics. Well, I, I think forward to hearing that. Uh, as, as, as you're aware, Pat, we, we as a senior leadership, we have signed it and we have, we have made that public and we have provided that to every guard station in the country as a demonstration of our, of our values and our beliefs. We do want to see everybody, everybody, everybody signing up to that. Okay. Moving on quickly. How are we in time? Another few minutes. Yes, GDPR. We're wilting. GDPR. <laughs> now, to really finish you off, no, that's GDPR. Really important. <laughs> yeah, we'll GD, GDPR. I will allow uh, your time for that. It's very and important. Maybe, well, one more then after that, now, please, if I can, because I'm so excited about the last one. GDPR is. Um, I suppose a big challenge for every organisation. Yeah. And I was a bit surprised to see that the request for tender for an application system to deal with it was only published in February and back now, I presume. Yeah. So, and this has to be, you know, you've got to be compliant, or that's the objective to be compliant by the end of May, isn't it? End of May of this year. You know, and you're a big organisation with a lot of information. So, how uh, do you want to give us any reassurance on compliance with the I, GDPR? I, I, I mean, I don't know the detail on that issue. I note that, th that it was a procurement with the Office of Government Procurement. I don't know if it was a procurement that we ran ourselves or whether we were, we were coming in on the back of others that were done. So I, I need to get more information about the timing of that, of that tender for you, Pat. I, I genuinely no, don't. It's in the report, yeah. No, I accept that, yeah. but I think there's a reference to an OGP yeah. process. So I don't know if the reason for it was influenced by OGP, by OGP timelines or not. I just don't know. No, it just would concern me that that's a bit late if you want to be... <coughs> I, I think this work, I, we can assure the authority that work is going on. We have somebody who is taking responsibility for this issue, and uh, that individual uh, is picking up on work that was already that was already undergoing, and we continue a pace in, in meeting our obligations under under GDPR. I'm sure as will come back to two last quick things. Estate management, you do talk about that. Um, and I don't know, you know, that you don't have enough money and all of that. Um, so I suppose what surprised me is was there not enough provision made in the budget when you, when you, when you, when you, when you were doing the budget and getting that signed off. And how big is the problem? You know, have you, the problem have, is huge. How, how big, yeah, well, have, you, have you measured the problem? How much would it cost to fix it? How long? I, I think I, I can't put a number on that at the moment, but I, what I can say, I suppose, two things. One, there wasn't sufficient provision made um, for ourselves, and there wasn't sufficient provision made for the uh, Office of Public Works. Um, we have been in discussion with you know, between ourselves around quantifying this issue, we would be meeting again to discuss the matter further. 
Uh, it's of enormous concern, and it is having an immediate impact to the point that even minor renovations required in individual locations to facilitate some additional small, you know, small numbers of stop moving in are not available. So it's something that we are discussing with uh, OPW, and we will be you know, discussing further with the department. Now, when you're demanding and expecting high performance from everybody, then it's only, you know, it will help greatly if they were working in fit for purpose uh, facilities and <coughs> stations. So I would, I would thought that you'd quantify the problem, measure just, the problem, and well, then. Just to step back, I think the issue really was that, that from day one that the, um, that there wasn't a sufficient provision made in the estimates. So I'm not criticizing, it's just a statement of fact. Um, and uh, as a result, we've had, to, we've had to look creatively for opportunities to resolve the problem. But um, we understand that the, that the problems will not be as severe in 2019. The issue will be for us, how do we manage through 2018 around this particular budgetary package? But just to say, like, and this is a broader question, really, the control, like you described, you would have thought it would have been included in the budget. We're not involved in the budgetary discussions, um, and I think that's, a, that's one of the problems that the Commissioner has a responsibility to account for, uh, the expenditure, but ultimately the discussions uh, on the, the budget are matters for, for other entities. Thanks, I'm going to move very quickly as I'm going to be run off the stage here by the Chair. Um, I was always dying for an opportunity to ask to talk about uniforms, and I note now that you have in the report that uh, there's two projects undergoing, a summer uniform project and anti-stabless cover. And I think it's, in, I, 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 it's, it's been some time in an organisation that wore, wore uniforms. I think it's incredibly important uh, that people feel that they're in the best uniforms possible, that they feel professional, that they look professional, uh, that they're fit for purpose. And um, I suppose if you note other organisations who wear uniforms every, every you know, could be 10 years, everything is relaunched, whether it's airlines or other armies or other police forces. And I suppose what I'm wondering is, are you taking a fully integrated approach into your total requirements in uniform? Uh, and, and, and yes is the answer to that question. We, we are due to go out to tender, um, and we're cu currently kind of evaluating the uniform, the standard, the quality of it. Everywhere we go, it is the one, it is nearly the first item that's on the agenda. Are you going to use a top class designers, and we have wonderful designers in Ireland? Well, we have wonder, wonderful designers. Wonderful designers come with a wonderful price. Um, what I would say is that we have a uniform committee. Uh, we have a lot of experience within the organisation. We have designed what we call an operational uniform. And that has been piloted in three areas, in, 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 <coughs> in, in, in Limerick, in Bunclody and in Talla. Um, and it is our intention, you, you know, we're all uniform people. We have great pride in the uniform. We want the best uniform for the people in the organisation, and we're certainly intent on providing that for the organisation. And there is lots of consultation, lots of evaluation <coughs> going on, and we certainly and will be coming back. Should. And, and I don't normally say you should be getting external advice. I'm quite the opposite, but on this occasion, I don't <laughs> think internally anybody's expert design. It might be when you're spending millions, millions every year, really, really top class design. Yeah. I, I think yeah. And, and, and we do consult widely with, with people to make sure we have the best of advice in, in relation Sorry, to Chair. Chair, can I come in with one question? Absolutely. This isn't my question, but can you also remember to get stab vests that actually are made for women? Because I hear that's an issue. Yes, that's an <laughs> that's observation. Not that's not the question. That's not my question. Very quickly, I don't expect you to answer this, but it's something that's concerning me today as we go along. 800 new recruits this year sounds like a lot of people to absorb. I'm wondering, can you afford them, both in sen the sense of financial budget, but also the absorption of those numbers of people, the mentoring systems you were putting in place, how is that standing up, given the, the, the thinness on the ground of, of senior people? We've seen issues around supervision. We're seeing issues everywhere. Everything we touch, there are issues around training. So I'm wondering about the opportunity cost to the organisation of concentrating training on new recruits, where there may be difficulty absorption, and, and, and thinning really thinning the skills on the ground instead of focusing. I don't really expect you to answer it now. What I would like to see, because it, it, it touches all of this, is I would like to see that HR strategy we've discussed coming forward and pulling in the training, the reserve policy, the recruitment policy, the training policy, the super, all of that should be, and, and the cultural piece, which we haven't come to yet, you know. Um, I, 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 I think it's something probably merits some thought at this stage, and I just put it out there as an observation. Uh, and certainly, we, we would agree with the with the observations that you've made. I think the conversation 
could take another three hours in itself. Yeah, no, it's not for today, really, but it, the integration. I, I suppose it's an observation and yes. affordability in every sense. I'm particularly thinking of the opportunity costs because it, there may not be a supplementary budget, but even if there was, that may not be the, 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 the most serious issue. <coughs> sure, sure, but Chair, if I could, in, in, in the immediate, in the immediate, just to answer the, 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 the earlier part of the question, uh, the 800 people that are coming out this year, we have previously looked at, at, at the allocation of where they, they are going. And we have ad additional training centres provided to ensure... And I think if the intakes, uh, and maybe it's not the 800, but the additional intakes that you have coming through, yeah. is it time to just think about how that's going to be managed? And I suppose we have no visibility, really, in terms of the HR view of how, how you're managing these people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. it, it, is, it is for sure a wider context. Uh, from the HR piece. Chair, could I just come back to, 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 to a comment I just made earlier on in relation to the appointment of the SAO, and I, do, I will provide clarity in, in, in the context of a note to, to, the, okay. uh, to the authority in relation right. to that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else on my side have any final no. comments or remarks? Just for my own part, um, Joe, you made a remark about the Commissioner and um, being the accounting officer and not being at the budget discussions. Um, you may have noticed that that's a comment that we agree with and we include it in our submission to the Commission on the Future Policing because uh, we also think the Policing Authority should have a bit more granular authority in relation to your big budget items uh, than we have. But we, uh, we completely um, endorse um, the view that you need to be at the table uh, on a range of matters indeed. You as, uh, you as in the Commissioner uh, need to be at the table on a range of matters. Uh, that um, that become your problem and for which you're accountable, but you're not in the room when they happen. So, so we agree with you there. I'd like to conclude by with a, with a couple of thank yous and a little commercial, if I may. Um, as I said at the outset, this meeting was something that we planned for a number of months to focus heavily on the area of children, and in preparation for it, the authority met with a range of stakeholders to help us to prepare. And I'd like to thank them uh, very much for the time and the uh, valuable contribution they made to our work and to, and that work will continue. The engagement with them doesn't finish with this meeting. Um, I'd like to thank the ISPCC, the Children's Rights Alliance, the Irish Penal Reform Trust, EPIC, the Office of the Ombudsman for Children. And we also had some engagement with Dr. Shannon, uh, with the Garda Inspectorate and with uh, Tusla. And I want to thank all of those because clearly to prepare for the richness of that discussion, uh, we needed to inform ourselves and, and um, we're very appreciative to them. Um, I want to thank my own colleagues and the team for, and you indeed, you, and your team for the resilience. Um, this has been a longer than usual meeting um, and um, unfortunately you brought it on yourselves by being late with some papers in February, but we had to suffer as well. Um, and uh, so I do want to thank you for that. I want to thank the commissioner for joining us long distance, and it must be really difficult, and um, indeed, Maureen, to engage when you're sitting on your own. At least we have a dynamic of a group going on here. So for sticking with us for three hours, I want to thank both of you uh, uh, very much for your resilience indeed. You mentioned, uh, Deputy Commissioner, the uh, culture audit, which we've made public uh, relatively s quite soon. And I just want to say that um, the next authority public event, which is an, a new departure for us, will be a facilitated discussion which will be webcast about the results of your culture audit with the company that conducted the audit. And that will be webcast uh, on the 9th of May uh, in the afternoon. And uh, more details will be available on our website. But it's, it's not a normal meeting like this. It's a webcast facilitated discussion to which the various policing oversight bodies uh, have been invited. And finally, our next public meeting is on the 28th of June. And until then, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for your patience.